Well, it looks like all the board members are here. Um, thank you all. Good morning and welcome. My name is Jessica Holmes, and I am serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. So we have a busy agenda today, and the first item on that agenda is actually the executive director's report. So I'm going to pass it over to Susan Barrett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to share this morning uh, some ways that Vermonters can save money on their health insurance. And we'll be publicizing some of recent developments in Congress through our website and other means. And DIVA also has this information on their website. So let me get right down to it. Uh, in 2021, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan in response to COVID-19. In the ARPA, which, which it's commonly referred to, there were significant subsidies for folks buying their insurance on the exchange throughout the, the United States. Unfortunately, these subsidies are, are slated to end at the end of 2022 of this year. Fortunately, earlier this month, Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Thank you, Congress. And in that act, the, those subsidies were, ex, they were uh, extended to 2025. They were also expanded. So what do, what do you, all of you need to know? And what do people who purchase their own individual or family health insurance plans need to know? They need to, right now, because these, these are uh, subsidies that are available in 2022, as well, in 20, as well as into 2023, they need to look at whether they're eligible. So if anyone on this call purchases their own individual or family health insurance plan, or if you know anyone who does, please share this information. So first of all, uh, the income thresholds, the ceilings for those who could be uh, available for these subsidies is quite high in 2022, and it's getting even expanded and higher in 2023. So for example, a single person in Vermont who makes up to $105,770 is eligible for these subsidies. Next year, that number is gonna go up to almost 119,000. And a family this year, if they make up to $297,215 is eligible for subsidies. And next year, that's going to go up to $333,000. So there's an important caveat to this, an important uh, action step. Folks who uh, are buying their individual or family health insurance plans on their own need to purchase these plans directly through Vermont Health Connect. Again, I'm going to say it again. They can't buy these plans through either Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP or MVP and be eligible for these subsidies. They must purchase their plans directly through Vermont Health Connect. And we have all this information or we will have it on our, our website this afternoon and DIVA also has ways to um, switch your plans if you're currently buying them through MVP or Blue Cross Blue Shield. To date, subsidies have uh, provided over $30 million to Vermonters, and there are over 23,000 Vermonters have taken advantage of these subsidies. And I just want to uh, crystallize this in an example. In today's, for today, for this year's subsidies, 2022, a single person making $60,000 a year may save $324 in their premiums per month. For a family making $100,000 a year, th they may save $1,396 or more in their premiums. So I'm very passionate about getting this word out. It is, as, as usual with healthcare, it is complicated, but the resources that are out there, I want to give you my uh, email, which is susan.barrett at vermont.gov, and my cell number, which is 802-477-3780. If anyone has questions about this, I will get you to the right person to help you. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Madam Chair. And if there is anything that you want to add or, um, if I, you know, to help us get this word out, that would be great. No, I appreciate that. And I really appreciate all the information, especially understanding the, the income levels for which people would still be still, still be eligible. So thank you for that. I look forward to seeing, you know, the link on our website for more information. And I think we should continue to share this information um at all of our meetings and i think until the moment it ends it's important yes sure homes mike fisher here healthcare advocate mike fisher here if i could 
just have just say a, a sentence or two um, just to emphasize. I, I think uh, I think asking everyone here to help us spread the word. That if uh, uh, and the, and in, a, in the simplest of ways, if you've been turned away, if Vermonters have been turned away from premium tax credits from supports in the past because they were over income or other things, uh, there's new changes and it's worth taking a look again. Appreciate that, Mike. And if you know, I, I know that your organization is going to be doing everything it can to get the word out as well. So we're going to do what we can. You're going to do what you can. And hopefully everybody on this call will do what they can, because these are really important expanded subsidies that will help a lot of Vermonters defray the costs of health care. So it's really, really important and we're going to do our best. And I thank you for doing your best. OK, so uh, thank you, Susan. Appreciate it. The next item is the approval of minutes from Wednesday, August 3rd, which feels like a long time ago, but in fact, we need to approve those minutes. So is there a motion for approval? So, so moved. OK, I'm going to take Tom Pelham as a mover and I'm going to take Tom Walsh as a shaker or rather a seconder. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. OK, so let the record show that there was a unanimous uh, approval of the minutes for August 3rd. So next up, we actually have some special guests today uh, in anticipation of this year's hospital budget season. The Green Mountain Care Board invited the state's economists to share their insights on inflationary trends, how best to measure medical inflation and how we might incorporate information about national cost pressures into our regulatory process. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh to introduce our esteemed guests and give us a little bit of background on the report that we received. Sarah? Good morning. Uh, so I uh, have been in my new role since uh, June of this year, 2022, and one of my first uh, duties in order to do that was uh, to realize that we were going to be grappling with some completely unforeseen growth um, due to causes that were bigger than Vermont. And so I knew I could use some expertise. And so one of the first things I did was draft a letter out of the blue to blindside um, two of the state's economists. Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, the state of Vermont employs two official state economists. One works for the administration, uh, the governor at all, and the other works for uh, the state legislature. And every year they do a consensus forecast uh, for Vermont. And so they are experts in Vermont, but they aren't necessarily experts uh, in healthcare per se, which they are the first to tell you, but it was important to get an objective external uh, opinion, I think, on some of these unprecedented things. So long story short, I blindsided them with an essentially um, incredibly complicated question under an impossible time frame at their busiest time of year. And so uh, <laughs> they were able to come through and help give us um, the start to some really solid guidance into in, to, in um, thinking about how hospital budgets grow and, and the things that we should consider uh, in that uh, analysis. So uh, today you will have um, Jeff Carr, who is the state economist for the administration, and he'll be joined by his colleagues, Bob Chase and Nathan Mass. And uh, the state economist for the legislature is Tom Cavett, and he will be joined by his colleague, Dr. Nicholas Rockler. So the way they're gonna structure this is uh, start with a presentation and then open it up for questions. Um, and I think that the focus here is how they can potentially extend this work to help um, us and our very formidable tasks ahead of us. However, I did want to take just one more moment to give a um, sincere shout out to our colleagues at the Joint Fiscal Office, as well as the Agency of Administration, who use their existing contracts and some flexibilities around this to, to help with the, the, the time frame. Um, I will note that we are about five minutes ahead of uh, our expected schedule, so uh, if anyone is tardy, that will be uh, on my shoulders, but it looks like uh, Mr. Cavett is uh, willing to start us off here, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I take it Jeff is not on the call yet. I'm not sure. I, I don't see him here, but um, I can uh, go ahead and get started. Um, 
uh, as Sarah said, this was uh, an analysis done in a very compressed time frame. Uh, and um, uh, we put a, a lot of effort into it. And um, I, I have both some uh, findings we think are relevant and important, uh, but also some further work that we can suggest that might help uh, uh, future analyses like this. Uh, the report includes a whole bunch of appendices and and the like, um, but I'm going to touch on a on a few things, uh, and um, uh, then leave time for some Q and A because I think that's probably where the most valuable uh, uh, exchanges occur. And if there's other work that we can do to chase down some extant issues, we'll we'll certainly uh, uh, we're open to doing that. Uh, it, in the report, um, on page four, there are six uh, takeaway uh, points that are key takeaways from the analysis. And I can share the screen and go to that, uh, or if you've got the report uh, handy, uh, you can do that. Um, maybe I should try to share the screen here. And sharing the screen would be great. Thank you. Yeah, let me uh, uh, get this here. Um, OK, let's see if this is. Are you seeing anything? Not yet. Not yet. OK, hang on. Uh, browse my computer. OK. I see Jeff has arrived. Good. Hey, Jeff, I already started. Uh, but, oh, good. Uh, I'm just to wear a coat. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, I am browsing right now to get to the uh, to get the report up uh, background here. And as uh, soon as I do, we can talk to that. But I was just about to go to those six points that were the takeaway. And uh, this maybe we'll see if we're getting there. I just love technology when it works. Yeah, when it works. Um, yeah, and Teams is different than Zoom and all the rest, so apologies if... Well, at least we're early. Yeah. Kara, Mike, do you have access to the slides? I mean, to the presentation? Kara. Yeah, I'll that's go. that's a good idea. Sarah <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we're going to page uh, page four of that, Sarah, if you can get us there. Um, so anyway, of those uh, uh, takeaways, one of the most important things is just the the really unusual nature of inflation right now, um, where uh, it, it it it's extremely high, extremely volatile, and highly varied by sector, and it is unlike uh, many of the other prior episodes. Uh, of really high inflation this nation has experienced. And that is primarily due to uh, pandemic-related uh, causes of this, both the uh, effects on supply chains that occurred and also the, um, uh, uh, the enormous federal response to the pandemic, which has just been an unprecedented amount of, of uh, uh, federal deficit spending and monetary policy that have created tremendous demand. So uh, the um, the maximum inflationary impacts in the healthcare sector are likely uh, uh, yet to fully register, 
And uh, so that's something that uh, uh, we'll be developing with intensity that I know you're experiencing. And uh, uh, leading that'll be the wage cost pressures, which represent more than half of all costs for most of the hospitals uh, uh, that you're looking at. Jeff, did you have something to add to that or you wanna to go to the next point? Well, uh, the only thing I'd add, you know, is to, you know, the, the proof is in the data, so to speak. If we look at the CPI, which is just urban portion of the consumers, it was up 8.5% in July and it was up 9.1% in June. And the personal consumption expenditure, which is a broader, provides broader coverage of all households, doesn't just focus on urban consumers like the CPI does. It was up 6.3 in July, uh, off a little bit from its peak or its current peak, um, you know, yet to yet to be determined going forward. It was up 6.8% in June. And if we look at the uh, CPI uh, for medical commodities, it was up only 3.7%, which is a lot lower than the general inflation rate. And if we look at the CPI for medical services, it was up only 5.1% on a year over year basis, which again is a lot less than the CPI. And even if we look at the PCE, the personal consumption expenditures index for healthcare was up only 2.1% for the April to June quarter of 2022 over the April to June quarter for 2021. So you can see that there's a lot of inflation going on, but it hasn't yet been reflected in some of the um, medical care and healthcare inflation indices. Yeah, and um, you know we do see higher wage growth um, among uh, uh, workers that uh, uh, have unions, uh, collective uh, bar bargaining, and also in occupations where there's low frictional job switching costs, uh, which characterizes a good good part of the healthcare sector, and that are in exceptionally short supply. Uh, so uh, there will be more. Uh, uh, cost pressure from wage increases uh, in there. And um, we, we have uh, presented in this report forecasts both from Moody's Analytics, which is a professional forecasting firm that we've worked with for many, many years, actually decades. Uh, and we have custom state models that we've developed but we do look at uh, uh, projections they do both at the state level and more importantly, their national macroeconomic model. So we are we have presented some of the forecasts from Moody's and then CMS, uh, Center for uh, Medicare Medicaid, uh, uh, also does projections. Their projections were from uh, March of this year, but were sort of surprisingly uh, not current. Uh, they still sort of had a kind of transitory uh, uh, set of assumptions to the inflation projections. And we present in the appendix their methodologies and things like that. But um, I, I think our take in general on both those two sets of uh, professional forecasts is that uh, they're overly optimistic uh, with a significant risk for slower near-term deceleration in prices and likely more like a three to five year period of inflation exceeding pre-pandemic levels. So we think there's going to be uh, a lot more of uh, a lot more delay in this. And I think you're seeing it in the healthcare sector with some of the contracts that have been approved where they're multi-year contracts and uh, pretty steep current year adjustments, some of it catch up, some of it uh, uh, current, and and then uh, out year uh, uh, increases that are higher than pre-pandemic increases might have been. So, um, Jeff, any other points on? Yeah, that, that, that data can be found on How's it going? Good. Can I just ask everybody who doesn't have their, who's not speaking to mute their microphones, please? Thank you. Um, th that data can be found on pages 43 to 46 of our report uh, where we, li where we uh, lay it out. And, you know, a lot of the inflation forecasts uh, expect that the Fed is going to be successful in engineering a, 
uh, a soft landing and actually getting inflation um, under control. Um, you know, that's kind of a, 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 a idiosyncratic aspect of uh, economic forecasting. Uh, people don't generally forecast recessions. They generally don't get into a situation where um, they forecast either the economy to go into a downturn or for inflation to take off until it becomes the dominant uh, theory. Uh, I looks looks down. like you're frozen there, Jeff. Oh, yeah, really? Okay. Oh, uh, I'm there sorry. you go. Um, you know, the forecast, the macro forecasting world still is kind of stuck in this um, transitory, you know, and will be successful in dealing with inflation school of thought that's evolving. Um, and that's partly complicates and makes this inflationary environment exceptional. Um, and unlike anything, uh, I think that you've experienced in the uh, roughly 10, 11, 12 year history of the board, you know, because we're talking about rates of inflation that are the highest in 40 years. Yeah, and and of course, if there is a, a recession uh, uh, or a deeper, uh, 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 a more pronounced slowdown than we're anticipating, uh, that would actually lower uh, some of the uh, out year inflation projections because that's obviously what the Fed is trying to do is slow the economy in order to slow uh, uh, rates of inflation. Um, we'll talk about a couple of, uh, you know, areas of, of inquiry that uh, uh, and, and analysis we did with, with some of the data. But one I think that's notable was looking at some demographic data, uh, which is sort of at the core of a lot of economic analysis and, and forecast, uh, in part because it's something that is uh, more forecastable than, say, interest rates or things like that. Um, we have pretty good uh, uh, detailed demographic uh, analyses and projections for the state that we maintain uh, and update twice a year. There have been a lot of changes with the 2020 census, uh, some significant ones with respect to medical care. Uh, first of all, there were more people in the state in uh, uh, based on the 2020 census than had been estimated by the Census Bureau previously, about 20,000 more people than, uh, than they had thought in 2020. But notably, there were fewer, considerably fewer, in the very oldest age cohort, which is 85 plus. And that age cohort also declined in 2021, which was very significant because that rarely happens. And, uh, you know, the, the, s some of that is pandemic related, obviously. We saw life expectancy drop uh, uh, in the United States for two years in a row, and it likely dropped in Vermont as well. And um, so uh, uh, that's th those are significant uh, uh, demographic events. We took some of the data that uh, Sarah and her team provided us on um, uh, expenditures and uh, looked at that by single age and then used a 10-year average of constant dollar expenditures and use then the forecast that we have for a single age population going out. And yes, the state is aging and yes, the state has a large elderly population. Uh, but even when you uh, weight that by the expenditure amounts, the rate of growth in demand, so physical volume demand is less than 1%, about seven tenths of 1%, which is a little more than double the total population growth, uh, but it is still not uh, an extraordinary uh, surge in demand. So that's that's significant and that's likely to persist, you know, for a fairly long period of time. Uh, so most of the budgetary pressure for provider expenditure growth will be due to inflation and not physical demand growth that's linked to demographic change. 
but for those keeping score, it's on page 32, 33, and 34. There's a 33 and 34, there are a couple of visuals. And then there's a one page description of that on page 32 um, of the report. And you know, this, from my perspective, was one of the more significant findings of our work. Obviously, it's still preliminary. We need to get the intercensual uh, years from the census for uh, 2011 through 2019, um, hopefully at some point in time, and we can refine this. But uh, this, you know, we, we thought that uh, some of the demographic changes that have been happening, at least during the COVID pandemic, particularly with our over 85 age category, which are a significant user of uh, of expend of healthcare expenditures, uh, was pretty significant. And I think what it does is it points to the you know the challenge that the board has uh, looking forward because so much of this is going to come from the price side of the equation, much of which is beyond our uh, reaches uh, areas of the economy that are beyond our immediate policy control. Yeah, so this this part of the analysis and uh, a lot of the other work that that we did stemmed in large part from data that Sarah and her her team provided, and it's a, a you know very detailed sets of data, and we spent a lot of time trying to clean and make that data consistent, because we need uh, pretty good historical data in order to do credible modeling and then forecasting of these things, and um, uh, even though there was a lot of good data, there are a lot of problems with the data set that we were working with. And um, so there's really considerable additional work that needs to be done to develop relevant, consistent, and timely state uh, uh, healthcare data that would support meaningful quantitative analysis and modeling uh, uh, for this process. So that's something that, you know, it's 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 a really important part of of any economic analysis, any quantitative analysis, is to start with really good data and to understand it and to uh, uh, know where there are omissions or estimates or quirks in the data so that you're not uh, building those into uh, projections and things like that. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we liken a lot of the modeling that's done in the economics profession to $100 saddles on $10 horses where the data is not good and you'll have some elaborate model that forecasts something, but if it's not based on good data, it's not going anywhere. And I would, I would, I think we all highly recommend, uh, uh, you know, work to improve that data set from which meaningful analysis could be done. Uh, one area we don't really comment on that we were trying to get at was uh, productivity because any cost increases, particularly in the labor side of things, uh, will, uh, um, you know, you, you'll have cost of living increases and the like, but you also should have some productivity gains that occur both through technology and improved practices and various things like that. And that was exceedingly difficult to try to tease out of any of the data um, and would be important. Um, uh, potentially also some pandemic related uh, uh, productivity improvements through remote uh, medical health communication and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtual uh, health care and meetings that don't always require somebody to physically be at a hospital in order for there to be uh, uh, health care information and, and uh, uh, treatment services. So, um, you know, so that that uh, uh, is is an important developmental area. The other thing we didn't uh, talk too much about were policy implications. And I think until there was a more complete analysis, we didn't want to jump to that. But certainly in the labor side of things with what's happening in labor markets, uh, um, you know, there, there's not a whole lot that can be done in the short run and there's not a whole lot at the state level. But to the extent that we have representation in Washington and I uh, uh, can can push for this. The reduced immigration that's occurred over the last uh, several years has really had an impact on on labor markets, particularly with uh, labor supply being reduced as a result of pandemic effects. 
And I think in the healthcare sector, we don't have statistics on this, but um, uh, anecdotal experience suggests both at nursing homes and at hospitals, there's a pretty large proportion of the uh, uh, staffs or relatively large that are either foreign born naturalized citizens or uh, uh, immigrants with green cards and the like. And that is something that could change labor supply in fairly short order if if there were a policy effort in that area. Um, also not included are any of the uh, impacts from the, the Inflation Reduction Act as it may affect prescription drug prices. So that's um, uh, further inquiry also. Jeff? Um, yeah, and then, then on top of that, you know, we have some things that are already baked into the pie. We have the, the federal national health emergency that's obviously affecting providers reimbursements uh, for things that we really don't know how long that's going to endure, although it looks like it'll be in place for at least six more months based on some of the news articles. And, you know, then you can talk about things like sequestration hits, you know, COVID reimbursement and all those types of things at some point in time are going to run their course. So there are all sorts of things on the reimbursement side, not the least of which are the Medicare reimbursement rules, um, which happen uh, based on projected data with a time lag with the most recent. It looks like reimbursement rules happening during mid. We're in on page 17, and it's a miracle that there weren't more typos in the report, considering the multiple authors and the compressed timeline. Um, so all those types of things, plus, you know, negotiation with insurance providers, which also happen, you know, and then set things for a year while, you know, price pressures are, are hitting provider budgets and those types of things is just the, the natural mismatch between the timing of when price increases or price declines go through uh, the, the, the process. And, you know, this hasn't been an issue for 10 years because we're in a period of relative price stability. Um, which is the thing I think that, you know, um, you know, caused us even to be asked to look at this issue. Um, I think the board was already and the staff were already feeling that. And it just is an artifact of the way things are done. Um, and so finding your way through that and then putting all these additional um, unprecedented uh, impacts that are happening, you know, in the general area of inflation and as they work their way through to the healthcare equation, it, it's really been uh, it, it, it's really been an interesting uh, thing to see, and you can see that, that you know area times and periods like this where we have price instability, and this can also be in the downward direction. You know, like we experienced in the mid 2000s after the uh, after the onset of the Great Recession. These are the types of things that um, you know require uh, some additional planning and some additional consideration in the scheme of things. Uh, going forward. Yeah, one other area I just want to uh, uh, bring attention to is on page 33, 34, and a chart on 35, uh, where we're uh, looking at uh, production functions that um, uh, are national versus um, uh, Vermont. And th there's tremendous detail at the national level. And we were trying to construct something with the uh, budgetary data that we had from uh, uh, you folks uh, that would allow us to get a comparable level of detail. We've done this with some other industry analyses in Vermont uh, with craft brewers, you know, where we look at uh, uh, their production function versus the national and they're dramatically different, and therefore you have a whole lot of different considerations when you look at uh, both economic impacts and, in this case, where you're going to get cost pressures. Uh, but you can see on the chart that's um, I, that follows page 34, you know, the level of detail you get at the national level, and uh, then at the state level, the table that's on page 33, uh, we, you know, we could extract. Uh, information that roughly aligns to these categories. Um, but that would be useful also to develop expenditure categories that map to these uh, uh, federal definitions of industry inputs. And then we can look at cost pressures as they flow through and um, quantify those impacts and also do that differentially relative 
uh, to national indices. So the most timely national indices are all national. There's there's really nothing local that's uh, I, you know that that's anywhere near as timely as the national data we get. But if we can uh, uh, crosswalk that with the national data, we could basically construct state level indices that are specific to the production functions of Vermont hospitals, and then use that uh, uh, in, in an analytic framework. So again, we started that, but didn't have the data to go as far as we would have liked. Um, Nick, I don't know if there's anything on that you want to comment on, but um, that that would be another area of uh, development we'd recommend. Um, only, only that you know there are some differences between uh, the way the Green Mountain Care Board accounting works for the expenditures and what we would use to link to other models, and we'd certainly want to participate in trying to identify without developing a whole nother bureaucratic burden on the accounting departments already, um, what data are really critical for us to, to get to differentiate healthcare in Vermont versus what the national numbers are, which are already 10 years old and which don't reflect a lot of changes in supplying industries that have occurred in 10 years and in healthcare, it's fairly dynamic. So we'd want to be able to get up-to-date data uh, from the hospitals in order to break this out uh, accurately. Yeah, so I um, there, there are lots and lots of things we can drill into here, but that's kind of broad brush um, where we're at, what we found. We offer a bunch of uh, indices to look at that may be benchmarks and indicators that, that would be useful. But I think this customization and focusing in on things that are timely and relevant to the state would be uh, uh, useful further developments. Um, and maybe with that, we can just open it up to Q&A and see what things you're interested in or have further questions about and take it from there. Great. Uh, thank you so much. This is really helpful. And it sounds like it's just the beginning of a long and fruitful conversation that we hope to have as we uh, improve some of the metrics that we're using in our hospital budget process. Um, and it's impressive what you were able to accomplish in such a short period of time. I want to acknowledge that as well. Um, well, let me open it up to board questions. Is there anybody from the board that has any questions for our state economists? I have a couple. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Uh, first, it's good to see uh, you again, Tom and Jeff. And uh, I'm still appalled that you would question the governor's recommend, you know, uh, way back when. <laughs> <laughs> you have a long memory. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's fading though very fast as we go along. Um, so yeah, I'm listening to you, you talk about the context of, uh, of inflation, et cetera. And, and, you know, and I'm look, kind of looking at a much more narrow um, view of what's happening. For example, uh, the total requested increases by hospitals for 2023 was $302 million. Um, and so uh, of that, um, you know, 78% of it is uh, through uh, the commercial payers. And I'm just wondering as the base we, we can have these kind of broader indices in context, but at the kind of narrower tactical level of, a, of approving budgets, I'm, I'm, uh, I would think that your work would help us understand what's going on with the people of Vermont and their abilities to pay and, and uh, afford health care, as opposed to the, the kind of tactical decisions that need to be made about specific hospital budgets. Um, just broadly, again, it's $302 million total. 78% of it comes from one payer, which is the uh, the, the commercial se se section uh, for our 2023 uh, budget process. Medicaid is actually a negative. You know, um, it's down by uh, less than 1%, but it's still a negative in terms of the contribution to the problem. So I'm just wondering about the, the the narrow base associated with hospital budgets and the, uh, the the kind of broader base of 
of the work that you, you, you folks are doing. Yeah, well, I, I think that taking it that next step to focus it on a particular issue like that is is um, I, it is what we would hope to do with better data, be, better local mm -hmm. data. Um, but the cost pressures that people are feeling are based in part on the broad uh, consumer price indices in terms of that side of you know what's affordable. And of course, everybody's everybody has their own consumer price index, you know, based on what they buy and whether they're renting or owning or whether they just bought or are trying to buy a place or whatever. You know, there's a very different mix. But if you you know broad brush what's happening in consumer prices or the personal consumption expenditure uh, price index um, is, is a pretty good measure of sort of what the uh, uh, buying, you know, buying public is experiencing um, uh, with cost increases. And certainly uh, wage increases have not been keeping pace with that on a broad, at a broad level lately. So, um, yeah, that's that would be where some of the broad indicators could help, but uh, it could be focused more specifically to particular areas if we had better local data. And I think the best the the best way to get Tom uh, at uh, what you're after is our third recommendation, where we talk about trying to replicate the CMS PHE methodologies and 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 try to um, Make them more specific to Vermont, um, and and look at the kind of uh, the underlying uh, expenditure series of our, of our hospitals and and try to get them at that. And then, you know, if we're able to get something that works statewide, we know that there's one or two providers that are a lot different than the other providers throughout the state, and we could try to do something and break them into two, kind of two categories if we could. And, and the other thing is, is that, you know, we were very specifically focused on inflation and inflationary pressures and trying to understand some of the inflationary pressures that may impact providers. We, we didn't get into ability to pay because there's already a function that the board has for that through the advocate. Um, and so we were very mindful of our narrow focus, which was to assess some of the inflationary pressures. That's that getting to, into ability to pay is another another whole data set and another whole set of calculations, which can be done, uh, but that's a, a lot beyond what we were at least initially tasked to do. Yeah, where there is overlap is we did look at general consumer prices because that's what I, uh, workers are going to be responding to in terms of wanting wage increases that will cover those costs. So it's really important to be mindful of just because that's going to uh, uh, be the pressure for wage increases, whether they're effective at getting to those costs, covering them or or more um, depends on their relative power in the market. But uh, that that's why it's important to look at, but it, it affects both sides of the uh, equation. Well, I, I worry about the relative power in the market. Um, you know, even in this process, you know, all 14 hospitals that we're dealing with are not equal. Um, and uh, you have tiny ones like uh, Grace Cottage and uh, large uh, enterprises like the, the UVM network. And in this process so far, the network hospitals have asked for uh, 69.9 percent of all the commercial ask that there is in this process and so again it's it's this kind of narrow narrowing of the base um, first it's you know and you know in the hospital process uh i mean these are very different entities in scale um and uh uh and their ability to leverage given uvm networks payer mix you know, they can leverage the commercial market much more readily than, you know, some of the other hospitals. So it's it's trying to figure out where the path is through that detail. And uh, um, I guess that's what, what what we get paid to do. <laughs> but it's 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 just difficult when when, you know, the the, the base is, gets very narrow um, in terms of 
if you're trying to follow the money, it's a very narrow base uh, to work with. I mean, some hospitals are easy. It's, uh, you know, I, I definitely don't want to step into their shoes, but um, they're small enough that you can kind of come to grips with what's going on. But, um, you know, trying to kind of view it as an entire system of 14 hospitals, uh, uh, I, I find very difficult. Thanks for your help. Thank you, Tom. Is that, do you have any more questions? Tom Callum, you're set? Okay, good thing I can read lips. <laughs> Tom Walsh, uh, I think you had a question, right? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, thank you, gentlemen, for your effort. Um, and it's nice, I haven't had a chance to meet you previously, so it's nice to meet you even virtually. Um, I, I read through the report and um, I think some places it sees there's there's um, a good matchup with what I've experienced um, personally and then anecdotally what you hear. The hospitals and healthcare delivery systems have been under um, relatively intense inflationary pressure for about a year and a half, it looks like, around 20, April 2021 or so in the graphs that you sent. Um, Vermonters have been under um, greater inflationary pressure in healthcare prices, a steeper rise in those prices over a longer period of time. Uh, premiums, for example, this is national data, have risen 55% in the last 10 years. Um, so the, the, the increase in what Vermonters are paying out to receive health care has been substantial um, and growing rapidly over time. Uh, that's true for small businesses and small municipalities as well, right? There's a great story about China, Maine, a, a small city in China or in Maine um, that went broke um, after it tried to self-insure um, because of the, the substantial year over year increase in the premiums that need to be paid, the, the co-payments, the deductibles. And what I was trying to tease out by looking through, reading through the report was how can we, with data that we have um, in the state, can we tease out inflationary pressures um, for healthcare services that Vermonters feel, tease that out from inflationary pressures that hospitals and healthcare delivery systems encounter trying to do healthcare or produce healthcare, <laughs> right? Is, it, it, I'm not sure that I, I phrased that correctly, but I'm trying to, you know, we, we are tasked with looking at both sides of that, right? Making sure that we do everything we can so that the healthcare delivery system is sustainable, but also affordable. And, I'm just I'm, I'm wondering um, if you could share any thoughts that you've all developed um, on those two issues uh, as you've researched and written this report. So as uh, Jeff said, we didn't spend as much time looking at the affordability side of it because uh, we were mostly you know, trying to zero in on the cost side. And one of the things that's, um, you know, that's difficult, you know, is to say, well, what is the product that's delivered? You know, what is the, uh, uh, and, and this comes into productivity analysis too, uh, what kind of physical volume product is there? And I guess ultimately that would be outcomes. And that's a really difficult thing to pin down. Also, there's timing issues with outcomes. Uh, you might have an expenditure in one year and an outcome that's several years hence uh, uh, measurable. So, uh, you know, that, that's, um, that's difficult to do. Uh, and part of that age, you know, related analysis, you know, shows, all right, you're spending this much more on you know, as you as you get older and older and older, uh, what are you buying, and what's the what is the volume of services and the quality of 
of services provided. So you can use the, the rough consumer uh, 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 price metrics to get an idea of, you know, kind of affordability because you've got income and we could do a lot more with the income versus cost side of things uh, uh, using data uh, uh, for the state. Um, but uh, then in terms of, of, of what you're actually getting, that that is still amorphous right now with the data that we have. We don't have much that's really hard to say about that. Yeah, not even a $10 horse. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's about a $2 horse. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, well, it, it's yeah, it's a, it's a it's a real struggle in with um, in healthcare the the data side. Um, no, I, I I appreciate the work that you've done so far, and look forward to working with you further in the future. That's my hope. So back to you, Chair Holmes. Thank you, Tom. Um, anybody else, Robin? Do you have a question? Um, I just really had more of a, a couple of comments that I found interesting from the discussion today. Um, I, it was interesting to hear your comment around the immigration issues because we did hear from a couple of hospitals in their presentations that they were looking to attract uh, some nurses in particular from other countries through um, the immigration process. So that was that was an interesting sync up with some of the hospital narratives. Um, and uh also you know quite frankly the the data lag issues are always such a challenge in healthcare when looking at indices and metrics and so it's good to have that kind of highlighted in terms of what we have available to us in making these tough choices so um i just wanted to also say thank you very much for your report and for giving some good context for us i think um as has been said this is an extraordinarily tough year um, for this process. And this is, I think, my sixth time doing it, and it's definitely the hardest, I would say. So um, having your input is extraordinarily useful. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. So just a, just a word on that, you know, with, with immigration, uh, you know, the United States is, is really one of a, a very few countries that could both attract as many workers at whatever education level you want to pick uh, and also assimilate and integrate them uh, pretty quickly, really, uh, into the labor force. So to the extent there's political will, uh, you know, that that's something that could really help. Another thing, and again, it's just a policy thing, but it's an immediate one. I, I heard, uh, you know, that one hospital had uh, was offering child care as a way to entice workers and make uh, make it easier for for you know some workers to um, to be there, and there is money right now in a, uh, a forty million dollar approved uh, uh, disbursement from the state. It's pandemic related money, but it it really does. Childcare is one of the the foci of this whole uh, uh, pot of money, and so any hospital that could fairly quickly you know, develop a child care capacity. Uh, they could get half a million or a million dollars um, uh, uh, for doing that from the state in relative short order. It's, you know, the application process will open up fairly soon, but uh, to the extent hospitals could avail themselves of it in state hospitals, uh, if that helps, you know, open up a, a little bit more labor, uh, that could also be helpful. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, and one other thought I just had as, as I was um, reflecting some more as you were speaking is, and this is not really for this year, I don't think, but I think one of the, the issues that we always struggle with in this process um, is the importance of um, the price setting component that we do, the kind of capping of, of prices for hospitals. Um, and we've we've had a lot of conversation on both the hospital and insurer side about what is the role of competition or quite frankly lack thereof um, in Vermont play in that negotiation that negotiation process. And I think you know part of what I think makes this process uh, important is that because of 
both on the insurer side and the provider side, a fairly minimal amount of competition in the state in the hospital sector and in the insurance sector, that those the price cap really end up dictating, um, you know, kind of the price growth. And so I think thinking about that as we move forward in this process and improving that component of it, I think is really important. So um, that's really more food for thought for future work, I think, uh, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you so much for taking this time to do this analysis today. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to open it up to public comment at this point in time. Mike Fisher, I see your hand raised. Good morning. Good to see everyone. Um, Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Um, I was curious about the chart we spent a little time on. I think it's on page 33. Um, one detail of it, I know I've seen this chart before, but I don't think I've ever spent so much time sort of looking at the uh, the interesting drop in expenditures with the age out of Dr. Dinosaur. I really mean this as a comment. I don't think we should try and answer sort of the comment I'm making right now, but I would be interested in discussions with people on the call uh, about this in the future. Um, a uh, couple things. One of them is uh, my understanding is Dr. Dinosaur goes through the age of 18, so I would expect the drop if there is one related to the loss of Medicaid coverage to happen at age 19, not at age 18. So that's curious. Um, the other thing is that um, there a whole lot of people move from Medicaid reimbursement for their care to commercial reimbursement for their care at that age. So we spent a lot of time in these circles talking about the reimbursement differential. One would presume that there would be an uptick in expenditures, all other things being equal at that age. So that's curious, sort of pushes in the opposite direction of what is often discussed here. And uh, though I think also we should note that with that transition, people also move from a place of zero cost sharing to cost sharing for their care. So there's economic pressures. Uh, families are forced to make economic pressures, not health care, economic decisions, not health care decisions for their care. More, for sure, when they age out of Dr. Dinosaur. So there's a lot of things going on at that age. And, um, and it's interesting to see it uh, uh, on the page here. And we could have a similar discussion about the, the drop at age 65. Um, um, and I, and then lastly, I just want to say, you know, um, uh, I think I heard you say that you you know you did not in this analysis think about consumer affordability. I might be reading into your comment a little bit, in part because of the um, the work that my office does and the advocacy my office does around that space. Um, but I I um, I would would welcome your. Uh, assistance and analysis in that space of trying to understand how uh, economic pressures impact uh, people's decisions to get care. Yeah, well, thank thank you, Mike. Um, I, I think actually the uh, anomaly with the 18 to 22 uh, uh, age cohort there has more to do with our very large export industry of higher education. So there is a, a, a population bulge that uh, occurs. Actually, Vermont has, um, I, don't, I don't know, in, in many of the recent years, has the very highest percentage of, of its population um, from the 18 to 22 year old cohort of any state in the, in the nation. So the size of our uh, higher ed export industry relative to the population is higher than any other uh, state. I think Rhode Island was second or something. But anyway, uh, so you've got a whole bunch of people coming in relative to the population who may be uh, uh, insured out of state and uh, that could be affecting uh, uh, you know what what shows up as an expenditure with the data set that we were using. So that's that's another uh, caveat to that 
uh, blip in things and in addition to the things that you mentioned. And um, yeah, the, the affordability side, as I said, there are metrics in this that really do, you know, give you some sense of at, at a national level of, of what sort of pre price pressure consumers are feeling. And so, you know, that's a start, but we could certainly do more with that. And uh, as so directed, we'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Sam, Paish, see your hand raised. Good morning. Thanks so much, um, Sam Paish, also with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate and the Health Policy Analyst. Um, thank you so much. It's great to meet at least virtually. Um, I know it's a little bit weird to meet people on a screen. Um, so thanks for your presentation and the accompanying report. I particularly appreciate the focus on the importance of data consistency to inform policymaking. Um, just have one comment and one question. Um, the comment relates to sections of the report on page 17 and 18. You talk about payer di reimbursement differentials causing hospitals to compensate for public payer under reimbursement by charging higher commercial rates. This is the cost shift. Um, and you know that this is a documented fact in the healthcare space, and you cited two articles, one by Fract and one by Wang and Anderson. Our office recently reviewed the literature in this area, studying the cost shift, because it's an area of focus for us. And we found that Fract concluded the evidence for the cost shift was actually weak, and Wang and Anderson concluded that the cost shift was not a major force in the healthcare space. So just wanted to flag those citations for you and, and for the board. Um, but my question builds off of um, what Mike Fisher was alluding to. Uh, one thing that we, I think this is a challenge for all of us in this space is assessing the relationship between price and cost, which is tenuous and how that interacts with hospital costs and consumer affordability. So I'm wondering if, if you were given more time or asked specifically to look at consumer affordability in this space, how would you approach that issue? What data would you collect? I'll let Jeff answer your first question because I think he wrote most of page 17. Um, and uh, then I can pick up on the second question. So I'll turn it over to Jeff. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I read those two studies and, you know, they seem to document what had been widely reported in the uh, literature. So if there are better sites, we'll put that in. I don't think you're necessarily questioning that the cost shift doesn't exist maybe more so that maybe those two studies weren't the best. I was, you know, it's been documented over the years. We've done some work in this space where that's been documented. And I was trying to uh, cite two widely cited in the literature sites. Um, so if the standard of those, you know, uh, you know, and I read them, but I'm not an expert in the field. If there are better sites, we can update those sites uh, because I think it exists. and. You also see it in certain payer categories. I mean, one of the things that I didn't realize until we got into this a little bit was that um, most of the Medicare reimbursement rates, which covers about a quarter, maybe a little bit higher in Vermont, uh, of the payer uh, universe, that they're based on um, uh, expected and projected uh, rates of increase for certain things, and then that there's no mechanism for them to true up uh, for the actuals. Um, which I think then pushes some of the costs onto the other payer groups, uh, probably not as much with Medicaid because Medicaid, you know, has maximums that are defined by Medicare reimbursement rates in many states. So I wasn't necessarily just speaking specifically to Vermont on that, but just it was a general site uh, for, you know, some of the differentials between different payer groups, which we didn't climb into. Um, but if there are better sites, I will, uh, I, uh, we can update that. And just to ask you your second question, um, you know, I think we would just start ground up and I can't tell you exactly what the methodology would be, but, you know, you'd be looking at uh, uh, incomes as being one metric for affordability and, um, you know, then uh, uh, opposing that with costs. But the whole way medical economics works is then you have all these non-market things that are coming into play that can affect that and who's paying and where their cost shifts and uh you know who's sort of insulated in some ways from uh, price impacts and who isn't and 
you know, so it 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 would be complicated by that. But um, I, it, you know, I we'd approach it the same way, just bottom up, and then see what the issues are, see what data are available that could inform those, and then try to come up with something that says, all right, to the best, you know, with the best data we have, here's kind of what it's pointing towards, or maybe here's what it definitively is saying. And uh, I imagine there are going to be pockets that are way more stressed, pockets of, of the population, the consuming population, they will be way more stressed than others. And hopefully we could identify them and quantify them. Uh, and then there could be policy options that are pursued uh, uh, that, that could affect all of that as well. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, yeah, not, not disputing that there's hair differentials, it's more just speaking to the causal mechanisms that I think is an area of, of study to be sure. Um, but thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, I think we would also touch base with folks like you that have worked in this space and just get input on how you see the issues and what data uh, you have been using and then data from uh, uh, Sarah and her her team that would also be helpful in in keeping it very local. For sure. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think we're going to have some interesting conversations in the future about uh, the role of competition and the differences between price discrimination and cost shifts. Uh, I think there's there's fruitful dialogue that could happen there. I think I see Tom Walsh. You have your hand raised. Yeah, well, Jeff, you, you beat me to it. The um, yeah, I think there's been a there's been a lot of of research really in the last uh, twelve years now since 2010. A, a really groundbreaking study by Stenslin uh, looking at um, this payment differential that's commonly that has commonly been called cost shifting and not finding evidence for it across the country. It's obvious after the after the last two weeks that in Vermont, it's a common approach to examining a budget, um, but it's not a gold standard. It's not an industry standard, um, and it's not evidence-based. The better health economic term is price discrimination. And I'd love to be able to keep discussing that with you all. Um, it's I think it's a fundamental um, misconception that is making reform efforts difficult. And if we can... Um, review the evidence together and get to an evidence-based approach to regulation. I think um, there's a path forward uh, for reform efforts um, that's currently blocked with an outdated um, conceptual model about cost shifting. Great, well, we'd very much appreciate uh, your sending uh, uh, articles that you think would be relevant like that and incorporating and digesting that and having conversations about it, uh, that, that would be very helpful. Great. I look forward to it. Thank you. All right. Am I seeing any other public comment at this time? I am not seeing any. So, I, you know, I really want to thank you so very, very much. Um, all of you, your whole teams there for providing us this analysis and, and joining us today. Your analysis, I think, offers a really important lens through which the board can understand the unprecedented inflation that we're experiencing, that our hospital sector is experiencing, the wage pressures that are real. Um, so we look forward to working with you. You know, it sounds like we have some subsequent analysis to think about, some data improvements that we can do on our end to help you um, thinking about affordability, thinking about how we measure productivity. I really am curious about how we can do that and specifically how we can develop some Vermont specific indices. I think that's really promising work that I'm really excited that we can move towards. I guess in the meantime, I would say we might have to recruit you all to teach some macro classes at Middlebury because we're always looking for great macro professors there. So uh, let me know if you ever want to do a J term. Uh, I'd love <laughs> to bring you on board. 
Um, so with that, I think I'm going to uh, move us on to the next agenda item, but I really do it with a sincere appreciation. I think you've shined light on some really important topics for us and given us some real evidence to, to help us make our decisions this year, just in terms of understanding the inflation that's happening. So really, really deep appreciation for the work that you did in a very short period of time. Um, Sarah, did you want to say anything, wrap up uh, before I kick? Oh, I guess I'm going to kick it over to you anyway now. Um, because the next item on the agenda is our fiscal year 23 hospital budgets. So I'm going to, at this point in time, um, kick it over to Sarah Lindbergh and her team. And just to give a little foreshadowing um, of the week ahead, you know, as everybody knows, last week we concluded our budget hearing. So we're beginning the deliberation phase at this point in time. This is just the beginning of that process. It will continue uh, today we have, we have on the calendar Friday, September 2nd all day and then next Wednesday, September 7th, possibly rolling into September 12th and 14th, although my goal is to have it wrapped up by the 7th if we can to give our teams enough time to get the orders in place um, before the end of the month. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh and her team um, to kick us off in the discussion. They're going to be providing a staff analysis and a framework for decision making. And this year, I want to say, you know, a deep thanks to Sarah and our team for the hard work and the thorough analysis that they've done. This is a very data driven and evidence based regulatory process that we will be embarking on as we um, head over to the next section of the of the board meeting today. Board members, it's a lot of material. So if you have a clarifying question while the presentation is happening, I actually would encourage you to just raise your hand if it's a clarifying question while Sarah or her team is on a slide and, you're, and if it needs clarification, just at that point, just raise your hand so we can make sure everything is clear as we go through. And I'll, I will leave some time um, probably before our recess for lunch for some questions as well, more substantive questions. But if you have a clarifying question, please just raise your hand and we'll take care of it as we're going through. That's for board members. OK, Sarah, kicking it over to you now. Okay, just to kind of bookend uh, the conversation. So first for the record, uh, I apologize for the mispronunciation, Mr. Uh, Cavett. <laughs> so that uh, have that cleared up. And then uh, I'd also just like to say that it was um, our um, explicit direction to, in the interest of time and all the constraints to focus on the inflationary pressure on providers. So that was what we asked for. There's a lot to unpack more broadly, and I think figuring out what we want to know and why, and then um, using expertise uh, such as theirs uh, is really the direction I'd like to go. So I will officially excuse them and thank them greatly once more for their time, and we'll be following up soon. <laughs> Take yes, care. Yes, and just before, before we exit, I did, Jessica, want to uh, commend Sarah and her team for the incredible responsiveness that we got working through this. There's no way we could have done it in this time period without uh, the really quick response, really thorough uh, responses we got from them. So uh, we appreciate that. I appreciate that, but I also want to say I'm not at all surprised that you received that <laughs> response. They are, they are rock stars and gurus. So it, thank you for that. It, it, I mean, it was it's unusual for us to be able to speak with people that are knowledgeable about data and statistics. Um, so it was refreshing uh, for us, but but again, uh, we couldn't have advanced this very far if we had to explain to Sarah's team about the importance of a valid time series for forecasting. <laughs> she gets it. Squad goals, let's get there. <laughs> Thank you. Squad. <laughs> Thank you again. All right, so sometimes my computer freezes when I try to present, uh, but let me know if you're able to see my screen. All right, so uh, once again, for the record, uh, Sarah Lindbergh, uh, and as uh, Jess was saying, and what we've been saying all along is this is really a, a team effort and uh, it was a big year of transition, not only here, but in um, a lot of sectors out there. And so um, Flora, Matt, Russ, and Michelle Sawyer were all you know, critical to um, kind of helping move this along, but also the board members um, need to <laughs> be patient with us and have been you know, great about trying to deal with some of our constraints. Um, our partners in the industry among the hospitals have all been 
transparent and responsive, and we appreciate that, um, as well as uh, relationships with our partners at the Hospital Association, the Healthcare Advocate, and uh, the Agency of Human Services, along with the myriad of people that I won't have time to thank uh, directly. But uh, Jess kind of just did this work for me, uh, but just in the deliberation phase, that's what we're kicking off today with those decisions due by September 15th by statute, um, but the written orders must be completed by October 1st. So we will start uh, just to summarize the public comments we received. So um, to date we received 45 comments. I believe that was as of the close of business on Monday. Um, there's a few others that trickled in through since then, but um, seem to be along the same themes and that is, that these budgets are unsustainable for Vermonters and their businesses, that the board should approve rates that fall between the all payer model um, 3.5 to 8.6 range. Um, hospital executive pay should be reduced. Um, some kind of uh, pointing out that um, part of this pressure is due to inadequate compensation for nurses prior to the pandemic, and that's really exacerbated some issues. We also had comments uh, relating to unacceptable wait times and kind of supporting ways to um, improve that. Uh, a few comments about uh, the bond ratings that should be allowed to fall, and then a, a couple others that um, said that we need to keep our hospital strong um, and that the funding is needed to help um, provide quality care to Vermont residents. Uh, we accept public comment at any time, so please feel free to uh, use the link to add to the discourse. Uh, at this point, the board uh, may not officially be able to consider that, but we welcome feedback at any time. So there's a lot that I want to put a pin in, <laughs> but there's a lot of really major change ahead of us. Um, and part of the goals of the Green Mountain Care Board has to do with this uh, seemingly uh, complex balancing act. It's, just, it's definitely a complex. I was going to say seemingly impossible, but I like to be hopeful. Um, and that is trying to balance the, the uh, needs for affordability with the needs for accessibility, as well as high quality. And you know, by providing an accessible, high quality and affordable system, um, we can you know, hopefully build us a healthier Vermont. And one component of this um, balancing act is that our hospitals really do need um, financial health in order to support these goals. So if they don't have adequate financial health, um, these things are, are at risk and things interact as well. So we know that um, unaffordable care may impact um, its accessibility. Um, and that it's more than, you know, geography and, and uh, ability to get an appointment. So it's a complex process that I know is not new to you, but I think this year more than others, it's uh, uh, just uh, enhanced. <laughs> um, pausing for a moment for a little housekeeping. If you have any questions, comments along the way, I know that might not be the way we usually do it, but I'd rather we kind of clarify things um, as we go along. So wanna do a check that we're okay so far. I don't think I've done anything too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so for our hospital budget oversight work, we know we have our work cut out for us. Um, uh, ne in the next few days, we should have a fully executed contract to re-envision the hospital budget regulatory process and, and some of the elements of that scope of work include articulating the GMCB's goals for evolving this process, um, identifying some opportunities for, for increased efficiency in it, um, working together to establish meaningful metrics consistent with the current healthcare landscape, including some consensus or standardized um, reference values and decision points. We also want to improve alignment as much as possible with our other regulatory pro processes. Um, and part of our homework from Act 167 of 2022 is to develop a methodology to determine the allowable rate of growth for hospital budgets. And that's going to take a lot of um, cross team collaboration um, to come up with something that is uh, feasible and uh, meets all these other elements that we listed out. Um, we also have on the docket to um, 
develop some value based payment and promote the long term stability of the Vermont health care system. That's something we'll be doing in partnership with the Agency of Human Services um, from Act 167. And then alongside all of this great financial regulatory work, we have bigger systemic changes that the Green Mountain Care Board is is collaborating to consider, and that is related to the all pair model and its next iteration that is being led by AHS, um, extending the current agreement uh, for the all pair model and negotiating that subsequent agreement. So the Green Mountain Care Board's involved in all of that work and um, which is being led by AHS and then we also um, have a substantial amount of community engagement to do. So we need to meaningfully collaborate and engage with providers, payers, accountable care organizations, and other stakeholders um, as we evaluate the hospital budget process and these payment models and future APM agreements. But we also need to build our current understanding of um, and of potential future states for our delivery system and look for opportunities to improve efficiency, lower costs, reduce inequity, and improve health outcomes. So I can uh, guarantee that we won't get that all done in one year, but I my goal is that by this time next year, when we uh, come to you, we have made sufficient progress and can update you on the kind of path ahead. But for today, we have 28 decisions to make um, per statute. Each of our 14 community hospitals uh, needs us to decide on the budgeted growth from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23 of their net patient care slash fixed perspective payment revenue, as well as their request for a change in their charge. So to set the table, um, there are a few constraints that I think are really important to keep in mind as we make these decisions. And one that um, is vexing is that um, if you look at the bottom X axis, it says approved uh, change in charge uh, by the Green Mountain Care Board. So that's a range of negative 40% to positive 40% because we want it on the same scale as the actual commercial net patient revenue that came in. So um, if we expected those things to be closely related, we would see a, a line in one direction or another where um, things would predict the other. But we see there's very little relationship between what's approved in that charge and what actually happens to the fiscal bottom line of our hospitals. That hasn't historically been true. Um, there was a time when the majority of payments were based on a proportion of the charge master. But as as time changes, we've realized that there might be better ways to um, reimburse people. And so I think it's only natural that um, as part of that process, uh, as we evolve, that we consider reflecting those uh, more appropriately. Um, and then we have another uh, more difficult to wrap our arms around component of these growth rates. So a total budget at the end of the day has kind of two major buckets. There's what is growing due to price increases and what there is related to utilization. And those changes in utilization aren't necessarily as simple as number of visits, um, but the types of visits people are taking. So we know that a primary care visit, you know, on a per unit basis is going to be less than, say, an ED visit. And so um, that utilization component is an important one and uh, one that is just more difficult to wrap our minds around when we are considering um, looking into the future. Um, the past two years have proved how difficult that can really be, <laughs> I guess three years now. So uh, I think <laughs> I think it's just really important that we are mindful of the constraints of this process. So it's a very blunt and very powerful instrument, but one that has limitations. So uh, we heard testimony from all the hospitals um, indicating some macro level um, pressures um, that are affecting people um, across the United States at a minimum and some globally. Um, and so, you know, we heard things about the increasing cost of treatment, uh, the inflationary growth in expenditures, uh, labor costs exacerbated by shortages and finding employees. Uh, there's transitions to technology shifting among the payers. Um, and then we also have 
people showing up a little bit, uh, they, you know, with uh, increasing severity of illness. So, you know, some of those um, stays are longer because people maybe didn't get the preventative care they needed during the pandemic years. We also heard um, some testimony that the aging in their immediate community was affecting their um, budgets on a, you know, community-wide level. So all I want to do is just kind of add, uh, add some context where possible to some of these claims and, and show that they, you know, are supported or not. And for increasing labor expenses, no surprise here. Um, the uh, the changes in the labor expenses that Vermont's system is seeing is completely in line with national trends. Um, as a smaller state, we tend to bounce around a little bit more, but um, overall these trends seem completely congruent. So, uh, you know, I would say that uh, that argument is definitely supported by national benchmarks. Um, another uh, piece of the puzzle that we've heard is that the the Green Mountain Care Board's decisions haven't been um, keeping up with the cost of medical inflation. And so, um, again, knowing the limitations of these measures, um, but trying to focus in on the, the crux here, we took um, two of the, the most closely aligned inflationary measures recommended by the economists, which is the personal consumption expenditures for health care and the producer provider in, uh, provider <laughs> producer price index uh, for general medical and surgical hospitals. So we were looking at the growth in those inflationary factors compared to the charge approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. And we see some differences over time there. So prior to fiscal year 17, it looked like the approved charges um, were in excess of medical inflation with them being pretty close to those values from fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 20. Um, and then, um, rising a, a bit above inflation in fiscal year 21. And so because um, for a lot of hospitals, the change, you know, the charge is, you know, 60% of the actual or the reimbursed amount is 60% of the charge amount. It's possible that, you know, this has distorted the actual material effect on the hospital's budgets. But I would say that um, now that we know how to measure this, it's something that we can be um, monitoring and that uh, right sizing. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a magic number here. Um, we just heard how complex and difficult to predict a lot of these things are, but I know that it's a important data point. Um, it does look like um, the charge requests uh, for uh, fiscal year 22 have increased. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that benchmark information available yet. Um, certainly can update it if it were to come in within the next day or two, but might have to live without that for now. <laughs> Uh, and so then if we look at that inflationary pressure, we talked a little bit about this during the last presentation, but um, there's two big buckets when I think about these inflationary pressures and how that's measured. And one is how that's affected kind of the household expenditures. So a lot of the um, indices actually exclude expenditures from businesses or governmental entities. So um, if we look at the um, inflationary um, increases that are affecting households, we see um, these measures, um, which are the um, personal consumption expenditures overall, as well as the overall um, consumer price index. Um, and then we see a very different trend for the personal consumption um, expenditure growth in for healthcare. Now we definitely want that's a that's a finding that we would want to unpack a little bit. Um, so one reason that might be changing is people just not getting care, and that would be a really important thing for us to understand if that's what's driving it. Um, and I also think that um, um, that the other important component here is that. Um, there's been criticism of the um, some of these indices because it has a fixed basket of services. Um, and if you think about consumer behavior, they might substitute something less expensive um, to deal with rising prices. But I think that um, that criticism is going to be less applicable for things like healthcare, where there's not a lot of um, substitution that's really possible, particularly in Vermont. Um, that might be less true in other markets. So I feel like I talked a lot. Just want to check in. Anything we want to clarify or 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 uh, go over before I move on to the provider inflation aspect? All right, hearing none. 
So here, um, again, we're looking at those producer price ind indices. Um, so that's trying to measure what the commodity or service is, is really being, um, how it's changing at the actual production level. So a very different indicator, as you can see, a lot more volatile as compared to some of the other ones. Um, and this has the same limitation in that it's a fixed bundle of goods. However, again, this is pretty specialized um, equipment and stuff. So there's probably less um, opportunity to substitute than some other um, commodity or service categories. Board member Walsh. I think you're muted. Uh, thanks for helping me unmute and <laughs> thanks so far. Could you just show me slide 13 again for a second? I want to check out the Y axis. Okay, thanks. That's all. Okay, easy peasy. Yep. All right. Representative Goldman, did you have a, a clarifying question? No, I had a spastic attack. Sorry. <laughs> Happens All right. to <laughs> um, and so then uh, this is just designed again at a very high level, um, you know, it is kind of comparing that um, inflationary growth for um, households versus um, on the providers, in our case, hospitals. And so we'll see that, you know, they, they've tracked really close or pretty closely, um, you know, generally, although that um, PPI growth rate uh, tends to be slightly higher um, in most years. And so this is actually the healthcare um, PCE. I, I apologize for not updating that uh, label, um, but that's the total healthcare um, growth. So that's going to be you know, the, the a broader set um, than just the hospital expenses faced by that household. Um, that component was not up, uh, up this as up to date as the healthcare component. Um, so another. Ask, sorry. Uh, oh, no, not question? at all. Yeah, it's really more translation. So the my takeaway from that is. Um, that the hospital growth tends to. Uh, really correlate with total healthcare spending. And so is it fair to interpret that as uh, because hospital growth tends to be a larger part of total healthcare spending that that is a major driver? Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's all definitional though, of course, because, um, you know, one great thing is to unpack because they do have subcomponents like what we think is, uh, material for any given process. <clears throat> uh, so moving uh, our attention to operating margins. Uh, so this, to start this data comes from the Medicare cost reports, which is a totally different data source than our financial information in our hospital budget process. So uh, the reason I'm using that data, however, is that it's a chance to compare Vermont hospitals as apples to apples as possible with those outside of Vermont. So uh, I think that um, really digging into the differences in how costs and expenses and um, revenue are um, reported for cost reporting service uh, purposes and our budget processes something we should really dig into and, and you know, make sure that we explore any potential opportunities for um, efficiency or simplification uh, for some of our data. So, um, but yeah, so here we have, um, it's a, a visualization called a box plot. Um, so for those of you that haven't had your intro stats class in a while, um, you'll see a set of boxes um, and in those boxes, there's a line right in the middle of it and that is the median value. And so 50% of the observations are going to be higher or go taller in this graph than that value, and 50% are below it. And then the um, edges of the box correspond to the 25th and the 75th percentile. So from the top of the box up is um, the highest 25% of the observations. And uh, similarly, the bottom of the box to the to the bottom of the axis is your lowest 25% um, of observations. And then those funny looking whiskers or lines with the line uh, intersecting kind of T-shape at them is 1.5% um, of that box length. So that's uh, kind of what a back of the envelope outlier threshold is. And so 
uh, you'll uh, since we have fewer hospitals, we see a lot less variation. So that whole length for Vermont hospitals is uh, condensed. That's not always true, but in this case, it makes sense just because there's a lot of hospitals in this this nation. <laughs> um, so there's just a lot of uh, variability in that information. But um, I think all that to say, um, you know, that our acute care hospitals here in Vermont, so these are our you know, larger PPS hospitals, have generally exhibited median operating margins below um, that of the non-Vermont hospitals. So um, they are dealing with slimmer margins, and I think that that is an impressive thing to note. Um, but I think the trade-off there in um, being you know, with a slim margin is that it exposes you to the volatility and can uh, lead to less ability to provide stable prices. So years where you have relatively large or small asks are more common when you might not have some of that cushion on your um, operating margin. So that's just a, you know, a factor to keep in mind in all this mess. Um, when we look at our critical access hospitals, um, we see a much different picture. So, you know, in general, critical access hospitals, whether they're in Vermont or out, um, have a lower operating margin. Uh, makes sense since uh, their their payment uh, mechanism is quite different. Um, and we see that they they're in Vermont, <laughs> the median uh, operating margins were above or near that of non-Vermont hospitals in fiscal years 12, 16, and 17. And then uh, some below in that uh, those other out years, and then in fiscal year 21 uh, and for 22 as well. I'm sorry, 20, uh, 21 and 20, we uh, looked pretty close to the national median. Uh, we do see in that 20. Um, there's a, a big skew to the data. So there's um, a lot in that bottom uh, quadrant, that bottom kind of 25% of the data. So um, that's gonna mean that even though um, ha at the halfway point is within national, there's more more hospitals below it um, than, than we saw for national. That looks more kind of normally distributed. Um, and then we see that both in Vermont and outside of Vermont, that operating margins are relatively healthy for our critical access hospitals in fiscal year 21. I think that's also been consistent in the testimony we heard and that the um, COVID stimulus funding was extremely helpful to our most vulnerable hospitals. And so so that's a you know a definite area to keep our eye on as those funds uh, are no longer um, as prevalent in our system. Kind of a risk opportunity or risk to monitor. So shifting gears completely. <laughs> Any questions before I do that? <laughs> Um, so then we look at, um, so if you remember back in October um, of last year, we had some analysis provided by Health Management Associates, the Burns Division they're in. And what they did is they did their best to take those Medicare cost reports and say, okay, what's the, if you take the, the ratio of what your cost to charge is per this Medicare reporting, we kind of have an apples to apples estimate of the cost of services. So we're gonna not only reprice claims to see what Medicare would have paid, but recost them. So what, what kind of credit would Medicare give you for the services you provided? And then we compared how much um, of the, that cost uh, was covered by the reimbursements they were getting. And we looked at it by Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers. And uh, that's been updated through fiscal year 21. So unveiling the initial results, we can do a, a deeper dive on the full picture. Um, but just for context here um, is that they definitely saw that um, from hospital fiscal year 19 to 20, there were um, increases in costs that were definitely not kept up with with payments. So the the average cost increased by 7.9 percent, whereas the pay the reimbursement um, only by 2.8 percent. So that's a um, uh, uh, you know five percent loss that they looked at for inpatient care. On the outpatient side, it was more um, more discrepant at a 6.9 percent. That story reverses if we look at the growth from hospital fiscal year 20 to hospital fiscal year 21. So we see inpatient discharges uh, right, uh, 
payments being uh, growing at uh, 3.9% per percentage points more than the costs and 2.1 for those outpatient services. Um, so that um, was better than those big losses, but you know it didn't make up for the loss that they experienced in the previous fiscal year and then didn't account for any additional um, potential growth in cost. So uh, all that to say is that um, this is you know more um, support for the idea that the fiscal pressures on hospitals um, are, are certainly seem to be borne out in our data. Um, so this uh, this red is bad. That's <laughs> uh, or, you know that that's it's so basically bad here is is the cost coverage. So it, the dark red means that the cost coverage is below eighty five percent. So I shouldn't add judgment here, but that just means that that's a risk if your if your costs are less than eighty five cents on the dollar or the, your your the money you're getting for a service is eighty five cents on the dollar or less than that. Um, but we see, you know, for inpatient that the Medicaid cost coverage um, tends to be quite low with um, a few improvements in fiscal year 21, but, you know, in aggregate, uh, not a lot of movement. Um, similar story for Medicare, where they tend to come in right there. We have to remember here, though, that part of the reason there's so much gray here is because our critical access hospitals are reimbursed based on those costs. So we fix that to a certain level. Um, and then for the commercial uh, bucket, we're seeing a little, you know, growth uh, or it looks a little bit of contraction from fiscal year 20 to 21, but pretty stable um, in that cost coverage for inpatient services. Now, outpatient is always a very different story. So we see that cost coverage in commercial, um, you know, with a lot of green, meaning that it's over 100% um, of that Medicare um, allowable cost big figure. But we also see the dark red um, in the governmental payers, um, which is that uh, balancing act and whatever the cause is, we know it's there and like figuring out like our goals around addressing that is an important piece of our regulatory uh, framework going forward. So when it comes to that other operating revenue, as you can see, um, that really was extremely critical to um, helping the system in fiscal years 2021 20, and 22. Those obviously, those big uh, growth numbers are corresponding to reduction in, in net patient care because people were um, not going to see the doctor. And uh, the provider relief, and, or I should say the COVID stimulus and other funding um, is you know, all but gone in the estimates for fiscal year 23. And we do see that you know the 340B at a system-wide basis has declined from fiscal year 20, but it looks like um, it's uh, expected to be pretty consistent from fiscal year 22 to 23. Um, I know a lot of discussion happened on that, and there's a lot of um, activity at the federal level related to that program, but that'll be um, something that we will continue to monitor. How about some good news? We always like good news. So um, our colleagues at um, the Agency of Human Services um, did some really big deal things and I take off all my hats. I, I just think it's incredible what they've been able to get done. And so uh, they have posted a global commitment notification that they're intending to infuse uh, over $23 million uh, into the hospital fiscal year 22 budgets. So, you know, some of those major losses that people were projecting for this year um, will be mitigated or hopefully at least keep the projections in line with where the actual seem to be going for our hospitals. Um, so that that's a major big deal. Um, and then I think that, you know, if you want to see more details about its bigger vision, um, Secretary Samuelson recently um, put out an uh, op-ed letter um, that detailed some of those. But, you know, with the global commitment waiver, there are big plans um, to address mental health, housing challenges, um, reviewing, uh, you're renewing those health insurance subsidies that we discussed um, from the state side, um, examining any potential to um, address provider rates as well as um, some substantial investments in health information technology. So uh, this is a big deal for the state of Vermont. It's um, just, I can't say enough amazing things about this and I'm very excited um, to see what it comes with and how we can work together to, you know, kind of help maximize the effect of this uh, very welcome um, opportunity. So Sarah, a quick question. 
Um, yes. So it says uh, additional dish payments for qualifying hospitals. So are do we have any sense of which hospitals are qualifying, which ones aren't? Yeah, so there's a, a few hospitals that um, had a maximum dish payment already, so they're not eligible to get any additional dish. Um, yeah, um, I can follow up with the details um, offline or, or produce those maybe for Friday if uh, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> uh, just a lot no, of pieces. I, I, it's $23 million. Yeah, I think it's only money. one or two. It's only one or two that um, are not expecting to have that payment. Yeah, well, it'll be it'll be good to know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'll uh, follow up with you. I don't have that document open. I'm sorry. Um, okay, uh, so that's that. Uh, and then this is more just uh, another one of those things that I would like to revisit, but I just want to remind people that, you know, the all payer model total cost of care is looking at a typical um, average expenditure for health care for all Vermont residents. And so that's going to include care delivered outside of the state of Vermont. And it's going to include care delivered outside of the hospital setting. So, you know, people who are not affiliated with hospitals. And so um, so we have both people in our numerator and denominator that theoretically have never touched our hospital system. And I think the other thing is, you know, when we look at net patient revenue and fixed perspective payment, you know, that's going to include care that's delivered to people who don't live in Vermont or for whom we otherwise don't have claims in vCares. So that would be the bad care. I'm sorry, the bad debt and free care. Um, the um, uh, the uh, self-insured plans that aren't in vCares, uh, uninsured people paying out of pocket, uh, military plans, federal employees. So um, there, you know, we're, we don't have a census by any means in the claims database. Um, there's also substantial non-claims based um, funding mechanisms such as DISH and GME that um, aren't going to be accounted for in the total cost of care. So I think, you know, anytime we try to think about how resident and provider metrics interact, that we want to be careful about those informational relationships. And so what the staff are recommending is that we explore that kind of inferential relationship um, to determine how to best incorporate that. Um, but I think that doing kind of a one to one, three, five to four, three, um, uh, probably um, could use a lot more investigation. So um, and I know that you've been asking for that for years, so I'm sorry that we have not delivered. But here I am publicly stating that we're going to get on it and make sure that we can use that responsibly. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Actually, so, Sarah, uh, might I just interrupt here for a quick second? Um, yes, please. I think it, I'm just looking at the time, and I know you have several more slides to go through. And I want to give everybody a chance to just if there needs to be a bio break or anything like that. So I think I'm gonna. If there's no objections, we've we're gone. We've almost gone close to two hours now at this point. So if there are no objections, I think I'll just ask for a 10 minute recess, and then we'll come back and pick up right here. Okay. I see nodding of heads from my fellow board members. I appreciate that. I'll take that as a yes, and we'll see everybody back here. We'll just say 1030. Okay, Sarah Lindbergh, I think you can pick it up where you left off. Thanks, everybody, for the, for the opportunity for a brief recess. Understandable. So I'm going to navigate back to where we left off. <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> now that we've talked about all the, or not all, <laughs> a smattering of macro issues that are very relevant to your decisions before you, we'd like to pivot and talk about our staff analysis and summary of recommendations. So we're going to start off by just walking you through how we're framing the recommendations, and then we'll start applying them um, to each hospital. So, uh, so essentially, in discussion, we decided that the thing that made the most sense for us, given a myriad of factors, um, is that we would recommend a decision tree approach. So the first step in that is, you know, is the request for the increase in net patient revenue and fixed perspective uh, payment within the guidance? If not, uh, we turn to the submission to see if there is support for that. So those are the hospitals that we are hoping to start looking at more in depth on Friday. 
And if it is, then our next area of inquiry has to do with the assumptions. So um, are the assumptions that uh, are behind that budget supported in their um, submission? Um, if not, you know, there might be some areas where we consider modification or at least exploring the reasons um, that they might uh, have something that's out of line with what we might expect. Uh, and then if they are, then we turn our attention to the charge request. And now is that request supported by the submission? Um, if not, is there anything that we would consider potentially modifying? Um, but if so, then the staff will recommend that it's approved as submitted. So just, uh, you know, not, not uh, necessarily the most elegant or uh, complete uh, tools, but we thought given what's before us, uh, uh, we, we're going to go with this for our recommendations anyway. Um, so one important in point about that growth in net patient revenue or fixed perspective payment is that, you know, through no fault of skill or, or um, ability, budgets have been really off in recent years. Um, it's just been nearly impossible to try to predict and, you know, <laughs> at hopefully once in a lifetime uh, a pandemic. Uh, and, you know, from what we heard this morning, we know that the long lasting effects are that are, are extremely creating extreme volatility in our current market. So for that reason, we think that and when we're thinking about um, the growth of these budgets, that it's probably more accurate and consistent for this process this year to look at what that growth is in from projections to the budget for 23 versus what it had been in the 22 budget to what it is in the 23 budget. And just to distill that, um, if we look at the difference from actual um, and the projections in fiscal year 20, um, you know, the projections were minus 1% off what the actual NPR came in at, whereas the budgets were minus 12. Um, we see that distance shrinking for fiscal year 21. So the projections were 1% above the actuals, um, but the budgets were still 8% below. And so as you'll see, if we look at the change from the projection to the budget in fiscal year 20, um, in the fiscal year 22 projection to the 23 budget, we see much different numbers than that 22 budget to 23 budget. So uh, that is, uh, you know, a little bit of a deviation. We believe that it's um, justifiable and important to keep in mind. Uh, but, uh, you know, just want to flag that, you know, it's not necessarily been a direct kind of decision point in previous years. Um, and so our investigation of the assumptions comes down to kind of three different buckets. One is the labor costs and investments. And that first one is required um, by Act 85 of 2022. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board shall um, consider hospitals extraordinarily. Oh, go ahead, Robin. Do you want to interrupt before I say a bunch of stuff? I don't, I don't want to interrupt. I want you to oh, finish okay. your, your thought and then I will. Okay ask my question. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so three different buckets here. So Act 85 of 22, the Green Mountain Care Board shall consider hospitals extraordinary labor costs and investments, as well as the impacts of those costs and investments on the affordability of health care. Um, the second component is the other inflation. So are those, uh, is the inflationary growth associated with other things besides uh, workforce or compensation within those um, in the economic forecast provided in the report um, by our experts. And then C, um, for the utilization, how do the estimated changes compare with that hospital's market share? Like, do those seem like they're relatively in line? And then, um, you know, just historically, how well have kind of projections uh, related to the actuals for that organization? Board member Lunge. Thanks. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, and it's actually on slide 26. I was just a little slow. And um, one of the questions that, and it's not actually for you, Sarah, it's for legal. Um, so they can come back with this, you know, not right now. But in terms of thinking about how we do our approvals and the motions, um, it would be helpful to think about whether there's some utility. I know you could translate the projections back into budget to budget, which is what we typically approve under the statute, but we do still have the authority to do um, COVID related mm. adjustments to our processes. So if it actually makes sense to do some sort of official projected to budget using that authority, I just wanted to say that out loud so that legal can think about that. 
and give give me some ideas for the motions. OK, I'm sure Russ has diligently marked that on his to do list. <laughs> we will think about that. Uh, so uh, to just walk through kind of how we were thinking through these three tests and, and the thresholds and where those thresholds came from. So for the um, labor costs, sorry that that slide got a little uh, messed up, um, but uh, the um, for the labor assumption, uh, what we're looking for is the growth from the actuals in fiscal year 21 um, to the projected uh, growth to 23 budget. Um, the reason we recommend a two year period is it does seem like due to that smaller Vermont volatility that there's just a lot more noise year over year so giving a two-year span felt um you know that we should do that to be responsive and so the threshold there that we're recommending again from the actual labor cost in um fiscal year 21 to the budgeted costs in 23 um is 13 to 13.8 percent that comes from the average uh, hourly earnings forecast from June um, of, of calendar year 21 to 22 at 8.5%, um, plus the range of forecasted um, overall personal income growth um, between the CMS and Moody's forecast. So a little bit rough, but I think um, given that the, the costs seem to be rising higher in healthcare than on in average, that this feels like an okay, uh, th this is the best kind of, evidence I could find or, or objective way to consider this growth in context. Um, so that that's where we're at for, for our test. Uh, for other inflation, we looked at um, the growth from the 22 budget to the 23 budget um, being in within the range of 4.1 to 4.5. So that um, corresponds to the forecasted growth in personal consumption, expenditure, service growth, and the general um to the GDP deflator as well as the CPIU so kind of the range of forecasts that um could potentially affect kind of supply and material growth um inflationary growth the reason we're doing budget to budget for this one is that's the way we asked um hospitals to report it in their appendices so it seems like we should true up to that <laughs> time period uh we were trying to mess around with other ways to measure it but um there's a lot of uh challenges in getting things kind of meaningful apples to apples in that other operating expense bucket. So that's definitely an opportunity for an enhancement. And then again, that utilization assumption, um, you know, do do the, the projected growth seem in line with market share and how is the uh, actual compared to budget um, in the past? And finally, for the charge request, um, so uh, thanks to everyone for doing their best to estimate what kind of the actual um, net impact on commercial uh, rates would be. So we're going to kind of really weight heavily on the estimated effective commercial rate because that's what we would feel um, as Vermonters and that's what's going to um, kind of uh, be the component that would show up in any total cost of care analysis down the line. Um, and then, you know, how does that request tie into the requested operating margin? So we just want to kind of try to balance those things. Operating margin is only one of many measures for financial health, but it felt um, kind of the, the most uh, relevant for this particular exercise. So uh, those that's what we're going to be applying. And so to kind of walk through and summarize the test so far. So we have here, um, if we were going to run that first test, which says, is it within our guidance of 8.6% growth from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 24? Um, up to you how much you would take in the first year. If we look at that budget to budget, we see that only five hospitals would have come in within that guidance. However, two of them actually, the reason the growth is within guidance from budget to budget is because they're below, uh, their projection is below the 22 budget. And so that's another reason that we think it's important to think more about the projections. And so when we apply that to the test, we end up with nine hospitals who come in within that guidance. And so these, uh, these range from 1.8% to 7.6%. And we see there are five hospitals whose growth is higher than that on the NPR and FPP growth. And we'll note those three at the bottom. Um, we see that it's uh, the 
projection to budget growth is actually higher than the budget to budget growth because they are not meeting the current budget. So I think that's also another you know, important thing to consider um, in these decisions. So, so that's kind of a summary of what would happen with that first test. Um, and then um, here are, and this one's will take, we'll walk through it. It's, it'll, it'll be okay. There's the three tests and then whether or not the organization met all three tests. So all organizations had um, compensation growth within that range. You'll notice a high range of variation here. Um, a lot of that has to do with the work we have to do in trying to get more consistent reporting, uh, particularly for the traveler costs, um, depending on kind of how the hospital deals with those um, that le led to these numbers looking very different um, for some organizations. So um, that, I think it all is compensation growth. Um, so I worry more that we're maybe not um, including um, all you know traveler expenses um, here, but I think that um, it should all sugar out um, in the way that we've um, analyzed this, but uh, we didn't see any concerns for people that were exceeding that 13.8% um, growth rate. As far as um, other inflationary growth, oh, yep, board member Pelham. It's the first time I've ever raised my hand. It's quite quite exciting. Oh. I'm glad I'm here um, for it. Right in the nick of time. But it took me a while to find it on the computer here. Um, so I, I just uh, so the compensation growth from 21 to 23. That 13.8 percent is a two-year number. Yes. So that's not annualized. Because I because I, I thought earlier on the other inflation growth that that was a one-year number. And here it's 21 to 23 at 4.5 percent is. So for compensation, we're doing 21 to 23, and that's because of some of that volatility in the wage growth um, right, in Vermont compared to national. Yeah. And it's and it's the two year number. Yep, it's all two year. Yep, for that. But, but in inflation, that 4.5 percent is a one year number. Correct. So that's a budget to budget. Yeah. So we're kind of doing the best we can with the materials before. Okay. Us. So yeah. <laughs> it's 21 to 23, but that but it's a one year number. Yeah, I, I did okay. update. Thank you. That's a mistake. That should be 22 to 23. Thank you. So that's yeah. slide 32. That's I'll correct the record. Thank you. Good that's catch. Right. You're paying attention. All right. There you go. Um, My hand. Uh, you think you just click it again to put it down? <laughs> or you can just do the rest of the presentation if you prefer. Uh, I'll hunt back here while you're talking. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so for the other inflationary growth, um, so uh, there were two hospitals that stood out here, um, Gifford and Mount Escutney. Um, as we'll see when we dig into those hospitals, those really are likely more of a function of, of relatively low margins. Um, in the case of Gifford, um, it was their fuel expenditures um, that kind of tipped them over um, the 4.5. Um, and then for Mount Escutney, they had included insurance um, in the inflationary factors. Not everyone did. Um, however, the assumptions they made for that um, were in line with other insurance growth. So um, neither of these, I think, are necessarily a, a showstopper. Um, for utilization, uh, so this is looking at that utilization appendix and you know what proportion of revenue is expected to grow um, related to the utilization. And so um, we see numbers kind of uh, all over the place, but there were a few that stood out to us. So um, the Porter utilization number at 3.5, we just wanted to take a little bit closer look at. Um, the Rutland utilization of 8.2 um, feels very justified. Um, we'll, as we'll see, that's largely a function of the fiscal year 22 um, assumptions um, being quite low than they turned out lower than they turned out to be. So that's more kind of a budget to budget issue in my mind than anything else. Um, and then uh, the northeastern Vermont uh, seemed, uh, you know, do we just want to unpack that? That's, you know, a relatively high number compared to some of these other ones. So we just want to make sure we take a, a look at that one. Um, and then for Mount Escutney, that was um, some stuff coming back online and, and seemed very um, uh, clear in the record. Um, so we didn't think that, that we needed to take a closer look at it at them for that. So. So there were three facilities that passed all three of these tests, Southwestern, Copley, and Northwestern. 
Uh, and then when we move on to um, the charge requests, so uh, this is you know kind of the ordering if we look at the requested change in the overall gross charges um, and how that relates to operating margins. Um, so we see again, there's you know these numbers are not necessarily close together and are different spaces apart from one another. So if we try to Look at that estimate of the affected commercial effective commercial rate. We see um, that uh, you know between both the requested uh, rate and the budgeted operating margin, knowing that the Gifford hospital margin is 1.5 percent of that total um, organization wide 11.4, that they would meet the test, um, and that everyone. Um, so uh, for Rutland, you know we see that. Uh, commercial change request at 10.8, um, much lower than the 17.8. So just want to make sure that we see evidence in the record for that. Um, I think that it's there, but um, just uh, was, you know, worth worthy of looking at for that. And then Porter, um, you know, we didn't get the the official kind of adjustment to their margin for their um, other facilities. So that would be, I'm going to try to track that down for us before Friday so we can adjust that similarly that we did to Gifford here um, to make sure we're doing that consistently. Um, so those are, those are how the charge request kind of analysis panned out. And at the end of the day, that means three hospitals uh, that we recommend be approved as submitted, Copley, Northwestern, and Southwestern. Uh, there were six hospitals where we recommended a review of the assumptions and or the charge request. And uh, then we have those hospitals who exceeded the projected to budget guidance. And so we want to just kind of make sure that we are careful about looking for evidence of why that's warranted for those uh, five hospitals. <clears throat> All right, so with that, that's the plan. Uh, we're going to start here. First, we'll review the standard order, uh, the standard budget order conditions, which would apply to every decision, just to make sure we're all good with those. And then we'll start going through the hospitals. But before we do that, everyone understand what we're doing and why, have any questions about where stuff may be coming from or um, whatnot, sundry. All right, here we go. Standard budget order conditions. So uh, these were approved as of last year. There were a few modifications then. So just want to remind everyone what those are. Standard budget order condition A is that um, the hospital's uh, fiscal year 23 NPR and FPP budget is approved at a growth rate of fill in the blank over its uh, fiscal year 22 budget with a total um, NPR FPP approved of X in dollars for fiscal year 23. Board member Lunge uh, wondered about uh, any ideas about uh, potentially looking at uh, looking at that growth rate from projection to budget. So we'll do some homework there. Um, just to flag one concern is that you know these budgets are vetted by the individual hospital boards, and um, sometimes it might not be at the CFO level of discretion to <laughs> necessarily implement a change that wasn't discussed ahead of time. Uh, but we want to, you know, be be uh, we'll we'll, we'll in, add that to our homework about kind of the the operational uh, effect it might have on our uh, regulated regulated entities. Well, and Sarah, what I was really asking about is whether we needed to do a motion to use that authority to do the analysis projected to budget. I don't oh, think we I necessarily gotcha. have to include it in the order or change the hospital's budget. Um, oh. So sorry that I wasn't clear. I bet you were completely clear lawyer to lawyer, um, but statistician still learning some of this language. Um, OK, budget order B standard for all hospitals that the hospital's overall average charge increase is approved at not more than fill in the blank over the current approved levels. Um, but standard budget order condition C beginning on or before November 20th of 2022 and every month thereafter, the hospital shall file with the board the actual um, fiscal year 23 operating, ooh, we might need to make a change there, should be the actual, oh no, for the current fiscal year's operating results at the end of the prior month. So that that's the monthly reporting that we require. Sorry, <laughs> I really 
really slow reader this morning. Um, standard budget order condition D is the hospital shall participate in telephonic check-ins to be scheduled at the discretion of board chair in consultation with board staff based on the year-to-date operating performance. Probably don't hear the word telephonic every day anymore, but otherwise uh, we're mostly doing these via Zoom, but I think that stands. Um, and by Zoom, I mean Teams. Standard condition E, hospital shall advise the board of any material changes to its fiscal year 23 budget of revenues and expenses or to the assumptions used in determining its budget, including changes in their Medicaid, Medicare, or commercial reimbursement, additions or reductions in program or services to patients, and C, any events that could materially change their approved budget. Um, so that, you know, uh, we there's a lot that we don't know about what might happen um, with potential uh, changes to the Medicaid reimbursement in state fiscal year 24, which would uh, line up with hospital fiscally, uh, fiscal year quarter four. So always that kind of delta makes it messy to consider. But, you know, if that ends up being material, um, that might be a time where we uh, get some of these requests. So just uh, putting it in context. Um, may not be material um, when you think about a whole budget, but um, it's there. Condition F, on or before January 31st of 2023, the hospital shall file with us in a form and manner that we prescribe such information that we determine necessary to review their actual operating results. So definitely always want to see where things actually land for a fiscal year. Uh, the hospital shall file with the board a copy of its audited financial statements and associated management letters, as well as any um, audited, con uh, the parent organization's audited cons consolidated financial statements. So those audited financial statements are the gold standard of kind of the financial health of hospitals, um, but the trade-off obviously is the lag. Um, so we always want to see them, but um, need to think about the best way to use them, I think, as we evolve. Good condition to have in there. Uh, condition H, the hospital shall participate in the board's strategic sustainability planning process. I, hospital shall you know, file things timely, um, and particularly any forms or information related to provider acquisition or transferred if we need to see that information. Um, condition J, the hospital shall file all requested data and other information in a timely and accurate manner. Condition K, um, after notice and an opportunity to be heard, we may amend the provisions contained herein and issued an amend amended order consistent with its authority. So um, I guess that's our backseas clause. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, good one. Never know. There's a lot of volatility right now. Uh, condition L, all materials required above shall be provided electronically unless doing so is not practicable. So um, I think at this point we're all able to email things and otherwise uh, do electronic filings. And M, uh, this will not constrain the board um, decisions in future hospital budget reviews, future CON reviews, or other kind of decisions related to the regulatory or policy decision. So. So those are the, the A through M standard budget order conditions. So again, these would carry forward um, for each decision. So any questions or need to discuss that before we kick it off here? Wonder Bob. So, oh. um, I just on all these standard conditions, uh, and this might just be a small irrelevant corner of the world, um, but which we, I can't talk about or we can't talk about until after September 2nd or 3rd. But I'm just wondering, is there any linkage or should there be any linkage uh, between this process and these standard conditions and the conditions in our uh, <clears throat> decisions relative to the QHP um, uh, rate review process? I might um, see if Russ wants to weigh in first on that one. Say again. I was wondering if Russ might have a comment before I uh, do. Um, I'm not sure. Is there uh, something specific that um, you had in mind? Well, I'll try to say as general as I can, but we had some very detailed conversations there about what to build into the actuarial analysis relative to hospital budgets. Um, and uh, 
you know, and that issue was addressed explicitly. And um, um, I'm just wondering if there's any linkage between what we did in that pond and what we're doing in this pond. And I and I recognize that in the scheme of the world, you know, the QHP population is is it's not uh, de minimis, but it's it's it doesn't drive the bus either completely. And I'm just just wanted wanted to know that. You know, once that QHP decision comes out and people will say or might say or might ask, well, what about this? Um, that uh, uh, um, I can say, well, there is no relationship or there should be no relationship or there are two different processes or or um, that we tied them together. And I'm uh, um, I just didn't want to let this go by and still have to kind of not talk about it until after. September 2nd or 3rd or whenever the, the hearing date uh, um, is through. I think I'd have to go back and take a look and think about the, that question a little bit more. Yeah, and I think they're, you know, one of the hard things about this, um, no one would choose this time like line. We would ideally have a hospital budget decision to inform an insurance rate decision. And I think the tricky thing is those decisions were made with an unknown factor um, for the hospital budgets, and, and there certainly were assumptions related to it. Um, but yeah, how, yeah, it's like a circular reference in your Excel spreadsheet, yeah. like starts <laughs> to break. Yeah. But I'll just add to that though, but they were assumptions um, provided by our actuary. Um, based on an analysis. So it wasn't just the opinion of the board. It was an advised op opinion to the board that we adopted. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you want to take that one offline, Russ? Okay. All right. Let Give us a chance to um, think through. Um, and, and I think the ones we'll start with, it probably won't be a, a major um factor for you but you know if it if it turns out to be we can certainly put a pin in in anything okay 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 here we go um so uh we are starting with um southwestern medical center they were the first to present and uh uh kind of for the one of those that passed all those tests. Um, so here is the layout that you um, have been familiar with. Um, just didn't want to change everything at once. So um, here on the left-hand column, you see their um, budget to projection um, variance for fiscal year 22. So they are above the, the um, budgeted amounts, which is a familiar story this year. Um, and they're requesting um, a, a 2.3% uh, increase in their uh, budget from the 22 projection to 23, but that's a 6.4% increase budget to budget. Again, uh, the, there's a lot of underestimation for, uh, for utilization in those fiscal year 22 budgets. Um, their growth rate, um, when we look at their actuals compared to that all pair model range, you know, is is within there. I know it's hard to see, um, but you know, we don't see any like crazy variations off that trend. Um, so when we look at the um, charge request, we'll we'll dig into what the effective commercial rate is a little bit later. But if for the actual decision for the change in charge. Um, it was 9.5% uh, with a 1% uh, change in charge corresponding to $835,000. Uh, the gross charges uh, are budgeted to increase by 9.5% for both inpatient and outpatient charges uh, with no uh, expected changes to their professional charges, uh, professional service charges. Um, and then we see that that uh, nets out to 7.9 million in commercial rate uh, in the budget. <laughs> uh, they expressed that they felt a lot of risk in their budget, so want to be sensitive that these are all guesses. Um, and then if we look at the um, change in charge increase that, um, you know, uh, at the MPR level in total is that 7.9 um, uh, in dollars, uh, which is almost entirely, it is entirely commercial in this case. So 
So then we see their um, history of uh, charges and the five year average. So they're at 3.4%, uh, one of the um, you know, lower values we see in that market area. So when we summarize all the tests for this hospital, so the first test uh, is their NPR growth below the 8.6, it is 2.3%. Uh, and then for each slide, we'll see the reference range statewide. So for all hospitals, uh, that that request has ranged from 1.8 to 15.7% with a median of 6.3%. So below median near the min minimum. Uh, for compensation growth, they're at 7.5%. That is below the 13.8. Uh, statewide in all the submissions, we see a range of negative 12.8% to positive 12.7% with the median splitting the difference at 6.7. So they're um, pretty close to the median uh, you know, uh, growth that we saw there. For other inflationary growth, um, that's you know supplies, um, other kind of things subject to these inflationary pressures. Uh, they their um, weighted average growth was 1.1 percent, which is below that 4.5. Uh, we saw ranges from negative 2.7 to positive 14.7, with a median of 2.1. So they uh, again are below the median on that. And for utilization, uh, their utilization assumption uh, for gross uh, revenue growth was 2.1%, um, look to be um, supported by the submission, I have a very good track record of um, coming in uh, to their budget. So uh, that's right at the median. And uh, finally, that effective charge rate, so that's 7.6% uh, in the effective charge. Statewide, we saw ranges of 2.9 to 19.9 with a median of 8%. So they're pretty close to that median. And their 23 budget has a 0.5% operating margin um, with the statewide range being negative 3.7% up to 11.4%, knowing that that's Gifford, which may be uh, not the best number to anchor to since they are uh, supporting a full organization. Uh, with the median at 1.7. So all these things uh, being equal, uh, we did not have uh, concerns about uh, the budget as submitted. Uh, and then just for each hospital, we wanted to take a look at um, that, that uh, if the charges and inflation seem like they've been keeping pace. Um, so the pattern for Southwestern is very um, similar to what we've seen statewide. So, um, you know, was uh, above inflation, they still were above inflation for um, 17, um, but we're right there um, in the past few fiscal years. So uh, looks like you know uh, that 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 they're pretty similar to the state trend. So uh, here is the uh, suggested motion language for you to consider, um, and I think finally you get to take a break from hearing me talk. Thank you, um, Sarah. So I guess I would open up to the board for questions, comments, discussion around Southwestern's uh, budget and the staff's recommendations and analysis. Any comments, any observations, any questions for Sarah and her team? Well, I'll just jump in. I think um, the I like the, maybe it would, I should have said this before after the approach um, because it's really a more comment on the approach than this particular hospital but i think the approach i really like the approach i think um, having the metrics is super helpful as a comparison point um, so i am for this hospital i'm comfortable with the staff recommendation Any other comments from Tom or Tom about the approach, the data that you've seen, or the recommendation? So are we looking to vote on this now? If, if the board members are comfortable voting yeah. on this now, we can. Um, yeah. If you have questions, you know, feel free to ask yeah. them. I think the plan from um, Sarah Lindbergh and her team was to begin walking through some of the recommendations uh, for the hospitals that have, you know, they're recommending approval today, or, or, you know, they're recommending approval as submitted. I think there's three hospitals. And then I think there's hospitals that 
that need a deeper dive based on the assumption tests that have been given. And so I think we'll spend a little bit more time on those. But again, we want to spend as much time as board members need on each of these hospitals. So these are the hospitals that the, the staff felt um, justified potentially uh, approval as submitted. So you, you can talk about them as much as we like. We can keep going if you feel like that's necessary. Uh, it's really up to the board members. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, Southwestern in terms of kind of my own little cheat sheet here was at the top of the list as well. Um, and um, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, but I'm just need to take a few minutes to kind of think about this hospital to hospital context uh, versus a more strategic context um, uh, relative to, um, you know, commercial rates and, you know, um, and FPP and other kinds of more strategic things that, that we might be want, uh, worried about. But um, so I guess I'll have to make a decision here. <laughs> and, it, just a and, question, Jess, process wise, would it make sense to take an early, would it make sense to go through, I don't know if this works for Tom or Jess for what you have planned, but either we could go through the three hospitals and then take our lunch break, or we could take our lunch break now so that the board members could take a look at those three hospitals before a vote. Um, I don't know. I'm happy with either approach, but just wanted to throw that out as an idea. Yeah, I mean, maybe what would be helpful um, is for um, Sarah, maybe go through the three hospitals that you're thinking, you know, might be, uh, be right for a approval as submitted, and then we'll take a, a lunch recess and we can come back and vote on those three hospitals if the board feels ready to vote on those three hospitals, and then we can continue on your trajectory of the other hospitals. So how does that sound, Sarah, and other board members? Reasonable, yep. That Tom, is that easy. something, Tom and Tom? I see yeah, you're nodding. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm fine with it. I mean, I'm, uh, the thing I'm trying to wrap my head around is the commercial rate overall. I mean that uh, you know here we have you know top side three hundred and two million dollars is the request across all hospitals you know and the commercial rate comprises uh, seventy eight point one percent of all of that and that's what I worry about I mean I I I worry you know I just want to make sure that that there's a point in time in this process where where the commercial rate gets addressed. And I don't think it's with this hospital that, you know, this, um, so, um, but at some point in time, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I'm fine with, with good going hospital by hospital. It just, I just. Uh, so why don't we do that? I think what we'll, Sarah will do is she'll go through these hospitals. We're not gonna vote before lunch. Um, I see Ham Davis, your hand is raised. I will also note that we will not vote before there's public comment. Um, so I will, we will offer an opportunity for that as well. Um, so why don't um, we'll, why don't you go through Sarah, the, the, these first three hospitals, we will then uh, have a recess and we will come back. And, and if the board feels comfortable with making some decisions on those three hospitals, we'll do that. Sounds great. Um, not necessarily super related, but I just was reminded recently how great recess is um, from my new kindergartner. It's a great time, so should not forget that. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, the second one is uh, Northwestern Medical Center. Um, so uh, I, I sent out some late breaking news last night, but um, Stephanie reached out uh, yesterday to say that they had some favorable changes to their um, projections and uh, it resulted in a material change to their um, ex expected margin. So they asked to um, officially change their uh, request for the change in charge from 9.4% uh, to 9.0%. I hope I got that decimal point right. Um, but the, the 9.0 is, is correct. So that they requested um, to change uh, their rate request to that. So uh, I think we were able to update their exhibits accordingly, but if there are any deltas here, that's just due to a, a time crunch and, and we can uh, make double check those uh, on the recess to make sure that uh, they're, they're correct, but I believe they are. So, uh, so here, yeah, so the, um, 
if we uh, so the other thing we needed to factor in for Northwest is the provider transfer. So because um, practices were transferred out, we need to make that adjustment on their uh, previous budget year. So once we do that, um, that you know their their request um, you know is actually 8.6 percent. So this has got the actual approved budget from last year, which is not quite accurate. So that um, change would be um, 4.5 percent. Uh, that 4.5 percent should say 8.6, which will get uh, corrected in the the recess. And their effective commercial um, change is um, right in front of me. 5.4 percent. So um, and then we have that change in charge, which uh, sugars out to um, a net uh, dollar increase um, of 5.2 million over their last year budget. All right. And so if we walk them through the tests, um, so again, once we adjust for both the provider transfer and look at the projection to the actual, we see that their growth is 5.4%. So that is within the guidance, uh, a bit below the median. Uh, their compensation growth, 4.8%, uh, also below the median. Um, other inflationary growth estimated at 1.7%, uh, also below the median. Um, and uh, utilization uh, projections were negative 2.0%. Uh, the record was pretty clear about how they were estimating that. They are certainly facing a lot of pressure in terms of uh, capacity, um, but it seems like they're kind of right-sizing that. So that seemed pretty clear in the record uh, to staff. Uh, so the effective uh, commercial rate was estimated to be a 6.0% increase, which is, again, below that median of 8%. Um, and a 1% operating margin, so they already have adjusted um, their commercial rate to keep that consistent. So these uh, favorable economic um, changes, which is the Medicare IPS uh, change, as well as that um, fiscal year 22 dish payment, which they were notified about. So that's really what's changed it for them. Um, so here we see a pattern not like the rest of the state. So uh, they were pretty close to inflationary uh, charge approvals uh, and then went below for fiscal year um, 16 and 17. We're right near it for fiscal years 18 and 19 um, and 20, a little bit above, um, and then kind of more in line with other state charge increases in fiscal year 21. So um, that is uh, their historical um, comparison to that medical inflation. And there's the um, suggested motion language. Uh, the 9.4 is in brackets because that's the one that, uh, if we honor the request, would be reduced to 9.0%. Uh, so that's why that value is in brackets. Any questions or discussion on the Northwestern material before we move on to the third hospital? Okay. Um, so Copley Hospital, um, so here we see um, their uh, growth um, being 12.1 uh, budget to budget um, versus 4.2 um, from projection to budget. So again, that's that big difference. Uh, we do see, you know, their growth rate does seem to be above the all pair model range, but as I think was um, pretty clearly articulated in their presentation, um, some of their growth um, might be that they're starting at a lower base due to some uh, relatively lower compensation rates historically. So um, I also think that they have been uh, increasing capacity that explains some of this. So we have to remember this is more than... Um, more than just price that's also factoring in utilization um, and then that uh, commercial if you look at the overall change in charge it's uh, 12 percent but estimated to be eight percent in the net commercial effect which is a 9.6 percent uh, net patient increase and so if we walk Copley through our tests um, their growth an NPR, 4.2% is within the test below the median. Compensation growth is a little bit above the median. They also are um, working on kind of trying to evolve their facilities to address community needs. So some of that is um, actually shifting um, 
to in-house labor. So um, that's one place where the travelers discrepancies are a little tricky for us to tease out, but um, felt like it was w within the test boundary of 13.8 for sure. Uh, pretty low uh, you know, other inflationary growth. So um, they were, they estimated a 0.6% growth, which is, uh, you know, very pretty, you know, relatively low compared to what we saw from other hospitals. Um, a little bit of a dip in utilization um, that seems supported in the record. I'm just trying to uh, really get it right with all this crazy pandemic stuff. Um, and then their 8.0% rate is right at the median uh, for the effective commercial change for a 1.6 operating margin, which is right at the median of all the asks that we've gotten. So um, for these reasons, so we thought that they um, that they should be approved as submitted. Um, here again, um, with those uh, not keeping up with inflation and the kind of longer term price uh, decreases that Copley's experience, we definitely see a few years where the charge increase has been below inflation for them from um, fiscal year 16 to 18, um, with some rebounding, uh, particularly in fiscal year 20 and right along the kind of state uh, typical area for fiscal year 21. So that would be the suggested motion language. Um, so uh, any discussions or questions that we want to review for Copley before we break for you to digest this? I will definitely open it up for some public comment. Pam, if you can hold on, but I just want to make sure that the board members have their questions uh, answered of Sarah. I don't have any questions for Sarah. Thank you. OK. Tom and Tom don't. OK, so I think at this point in time, I will open it up for any kind of public comment about what the information that's presented so far. Uh, we will then take uh, an hour recess um, so board members can think about these three hospitals and uh, we will then come back from that and potentially vote on these three hospitals if board members feel comfortable with that. If they don't, we will keep moving on. So at this point, um, I see your hand is raised. Ham, would you like to make a comment? Uh, and not on the subject, uh, Madam Chair. I, I'm just I'm all, all the only slide I have seen is the very first one, hospital budget decision schedule. I'm, is that just me? Because I can't see any of the subsequent uh, uh, slides by Sarah. Am I? That's is, that, is everybody else. Is, I don't, I don't know whether that's just me. I don't know what I do. Uh, I don't comment on the substance at all. OK. I, I, I'm not sure if there's anybody else having a difficult time seeing slides. Please um, raise your hand. OK, Ham, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. So maybe during the break, it might be possible for somebody from our staff to, to give you a call and see if there's something that we can do to help you with on your end. But I'm not seeing any other um, concerns about not being able to see the slides. I would, I would, the, thank you. Or if the slides are posted, that would be another way. Well, I can't, I mean, I can't follow. I, 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 I see one slide and I, it's hard to follow the discussion without seeing the slide that she's working. That's my only point. Madam Chair, this is Susan Barrett. I'll reach out to Mr. Davis and we'll get him situated. Thank you. Sorry about that, Ham. We'll fix no that for you. Thank you. Um, board Member Walsh, I see your hand raised. Thank you, uh, Jess. Sarah, um, could you go back just a, a couple slides for Copley? So here it looks like the MPR growth would be 4.2. On the slide we ended on, it's 12.1. And I, I seem to miss that. Yeah, so I think there's uh, two things going on. So 12.1 is the um, budget to budget. So we're looking at the projection to budget. So that's one. And then um, Wait, the other sorry. issue. Sorry, oh. can I just interrupt? 12.1, uh, Tom, is the budget to budget growth in NPR. The 4.2 is the fiscal year 22 projection to fiscal year 23 budget. That's the 12.1 versus the 4.2. And when you flip the side, the test that the staff is using is the projected to budget test. So that's yes. why the 4.2 is there. Does that make yes. sense? 
Um, yes, I followed that, but I thought on the on the prior two hospitals, the final slide with suggested language used the projected. So this would be 4.5. Yeah, so we, um, because the guidance says we're going to make these decisions from budget, budget to budget, we're kind of backing into what the associated budget to budget increase is, but we're deciding or recommending that the meaningful measure is projection to um, act, uh, budget. Right. In the, okay. I was just going to say, okay. I think this relates to board member Lunge's question about do we, you know, uh, make a motion that allows us to use the projected to budget in our motions. Is that correct, board member Lunge? I mean, that's something that the legal team can help us think about maybe over the recess is what the, the actual motion language should have in it. I see Russ is here. Maybe he has a thought on that. Yeah, sorry, this is Russ. If I can jump in with two things. Um, the reason that we have budget, well, one reason that we have budget to budget in the motion language is that it's very clear what the approved budget NPR FPV was for 22. So it's very clear what it'll be for 23. When you talk about projections, the, those are projections made as of a certain date. And we're, you know, we're using the projections that we have that have been supplied by hospitals, but they those projections may change. So it's clearer in the motion language to reference the increase from the prior budget. I think to board member Lunch's question before, um, I've been doing a little bit of thinking of it, and uh, it may be prudent for the board to explicitly recognize that um, because of a lot of variation in hospital budget performance, which um, the board may, I think, reasonably determine is attributed to uh, some impact from COVID, that the board is um, expanding on its guidance a little bit to allow consideration of budgets that are within the 8.6% projection to budget, and not just budget to budget. Um, under the guidance and the rule, um, the board is allowed to look at prior hospital performance. And so it's not, what we're doing is not um, unsupported otherwise, but I do think it, it may be a good idea to formally recognize that that is a consideration that the staff is making in, in um, you know, as part of the uh, budget analysis and presentation here. But I'm happy to discuss that um, or think about that a little bit more over at the lunch break as well. Great. Thank you for that. Um, were there other board member questions at this point? Okay, one of the things, Susan and Sarah, I'm going to ask if you would be willing to post the slides um, that you have for this morning session, um, maybe up through what you're anticipating we'll get through this afternoon uh, on the on the website. So for those who are having a difficult time seeing the slides, they will be able to do so. If, for Ham and for anybody else, they want a deeper dive into the slides. Uh, at this point in time, Ham, I see your hand is raised. Is that from before? I think that may have been from before. So at this point in time, it's 1125. And I think what we'll do is we'll take, if there's no objections from the board members, I think we'll take a recess for an hour, an hour and five minutes. We'll come back at 1230. And we will resume uh, with a discussion of these three hospitals. And potentially, we'll at least have a, a, a some sense of where the staff is coming in on a few more. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. We'll see you at 1230.